went to Bury. But the double hernia thing, I was wrecked. Like. And Graham Barrow was a brilliant manager. I went in first day and scored probably one of the best goals of my career. And it was about middle of December, I went and seen the surgeon. He just said to me, how are you feeling? I said, I'm in agony. The surgeon said to me, they're the worst tears I've ever seen. He said, how long have you had this one? I was like, mm, seven years. He went, you're only 25. You should have just came in as a, as a young player. And I would just wanted to play. Hello everyone, welcome back to the seven, second episode of the PSA podcast for 2023. We're absolutely delighted to have Ards Football Club first team manager, Matthew Tipton, on the show. Good to be here, good to see you again. Good stuff, great to see you. And uh, we're just going to get the, sh- the show started the way we normally do. And just, what is your earliest memories of, you know, starting football, playing football? I think, well, everything, all I can remember from being a child was playing football. Just be out in the street. We live in a big, massive estate in, in North Wales, uh, Bangor, my second estate, and everybody just seemed to be out all the time. I think even age of three and four, you know, and, and obviously as you as you get older, people, you know, when I kind of became a footballer, you know, friends of the family or or family would say that they just only ever see me with the ball. You know, I couldn't go to the shop without a football. You know, kicking it up and down the hill and and down the street. So. My whole life's just been around football, to be honest. You know, my dad would have played at a decent level, um, like amateur league and, and Sunday league stuff. And I would just remember going with them and, and I like, just wanted to join in. And I was probably five or six, you know, trying to play with men. And, and then I wanted to join a team. And our local team was my Brin. They were, you know, really successful. But the way football was, obviously, we're talking now, 1985, 86, it wasn't like, um, you know, now hundreds of kids' teams. Their first age group was under 14s. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, you know, there was no under six, five, um, and, I, and I used to go training. I used to go training in the 14s when I was like six and seven, and there was, no, <laughs> there was no big dramas about that. And they had a lot of good players who, you know, went on and played like League of Wales football and stuff. And, and like, they were like, you know, I was like, he's brilliant. And I remember there was a lad, Neil Hughes, and he, and he was unbelievable. He's scoring, you know, 80 and 90 goals a season. And I was like, oh, flip, I wish I was, you know, I wish I could be as good as him. And, and I remember they, they were going on trial to Liverpool and, and different places. And I was about seven, I went up with them. Mini bus full, there was about six lads that went on trial. And I jumped, jumped in the bus, John Owen, um, the manager, dro- drove them up. Um, and, I, and I was just kicking the ball about, you know, at the side of the pitch, as you do when, you, when you're youngster. And Steve Highway was over and he, and he then said, look, John, when Matthew gets a bit older, we'd love to, to bring him into Liverpool. Um, so but I was nine at that stage. Um, I, I went up to Liverpool and signed uh, School of Excellence forms with them then. Then, because obviously I'd still never played any, like, organised football. It, if that makes sense, because there was no team, there was no under 12s was the very first, but we didn't have a team at under 12 at Mice Brent. So I played in the school team. I was junior one, you know, with the junior fours, that was kind of like my first organised football, eight, seven or eight side or whatever it was. And I remember I scored a diving header in my first game. I don't think I scored a header again until I was about 23. <laughs> um, I didn't really like heading it, it hurt. Yeah, <laughs> but I perfected volleying, I, I would rather volley it. So. That was probably, I remember my very first game for my school and, and then, like I say, I went on and played for my Brynn then they got an under-12s team and I was nine. Played the first two league games of the season. I scored a hat-trick in both games and then the league, somebody put a complaint and basically said it wasn't fair. I was too young to play. So, because the, the rule was you had to be within two years of, so 12, you had to be 10 to play in the under-12s. And because I was only just turned nine, they brought this rule in and said that I couldn't, I was banned basically for a year for playing in that league. So Broughton Super Saints uh, were based just outside of Chester um, and their league had an under 10s league. Um, my dad knew that, or somebody, I think John knew their, their manager, they were a real big club. Um, that was about an hour away from us. I uh, got in touch with them and myself and another lad, Philip Burton. We both went up there every Saturday, so my mum would have took us on the train or Philip's dad would have took us on the train, whatever, you know, took a turn about. And we went up and down there. It, like, thinking about it, you know, the commitment that, that our parents had to show just to let us play football f- for a year because we were banned from playing it, like, stupid, really. Um, we were banned from playing because we were too young. And then we went up and there, and it was brilliant. And I went there, like I said, did a full year, and at that stage I'd been up to Liverpool um, during that school holidays, but it was the following year that I kind of really... Like when I got turned 10, I, I was going up to Liverpool and every week I did my year with Broughton, we won the league and Cop and, 
and wherever else. And that was the first time at that stage, my first year of football, I scored 100. And, I scored 135 goals, and because like it, it's easy to stick in your head. Obviously, it was a long time ago when I was nine, but the, our door number was 135, um, and and the local press came and did a big piece about it, and then like I said, went on then to Liverpool, and then obviously came back, played for my sub Brennan, and, and I loved that time. Like I didn't know anything different. I was just a young kid who just loved football. Like and everybody kind of on our estate knew that I was good you know we kind of kicking the ball about and it just used to go on a Saturday and I just like I didn't know anything different than just scoring like like minimum hat-tricks every week um, I scored from the age of nine then all the way up to like obviously I left home at 16 time for Oldham I scored a minimum of 100 goals every season um, and like one year it was like 178 or something and like you're only playing 20 games 25 games in the season it's like six in a game I scored 13 twice, 11, like about five times I scored 11 in a game. Like, and if, if you're doing that now, it would be like mad. Imagine like social media saying all this. And, but honestly, it, like they were just then, right? And I know you can say things were better or worse, whatever, I don't know. But basically there was only 12 teams in the league. So it was real competitive football. And I know that sounds stupid. How can it be comp competitive? You're scoring like 11 in a game. And we were winning 15 nil and stuff. But because there wasn't like, like I just think there's too many teams and clubs now. Mm -hmm. Like there's the like, kids playing and there's like five divisions in each league and there's like a hundred boys teams, but the quality's getting diluted. Where you think for our area, you know, Abercrombie area it was, that, that stretch from like people here won't know, right? But basically Colwyn Bay all the way through to Bangor. And so you've Colwyn Bay, which is a big town. San Edno, and, and obviously then you've all the little offshoots of you know towns all around it, Penrhyn Bay, Conway, another big town, Llandolas, um, Panama, Llanberhan, and obviously ourselves. Like that's that's a big you know that's a big area for that amount of people. That would be the equivalent of obviously you've Belfast here, so you know that's a big enough area for itself. But it'd be pretty much um, you know there's probably thirty or forty miles there of, of travelling, you know of, of towns. So. You, you had to really be a good player. Like we had trials to get into our like our team, where that wouldn't happen. Our parents would be kicking off. They'd be mm -hmm. Facebook. That's not fair. My son's been told he's not good enough. But it did us no harm. And and I think you know people need to realise football's a tough industry. And from the age of well, obviously myself at the age of nine, being told some weeks you weren't good enough, it didn't do us mm -hmm. no harm. You know, like I say, I went up to Liverpool and they had trials six weeks. I remember going. And they, and they called my mum and dad over after the first one. And you know, I was nine, like I didn't know any different. And, and I was thinking, oh, like I'm definitely like good enough to play for Liverpool <laughs> like at that age. Because you're nine, you don't know. But it's, you know, my mum and dad were like, you know, we might, they might tell you you're not good enough. You know, you might not come back. But after the first week, they said, look, you don't have to come for the rest of the trials. Just start in when it's September or whatever. We, we started and then I was hopping down to Liverpool then a couple of times a week for the next three years so it was like my last year in primary school and the first year and second year and third year actually um yeah and then oldham opened up a center of excellence in north wales which helped so even though i was like associated with liverpool the training suited better because we were going to colin bay for training at that stage and and like willie donachie who was first team manager at oldham would come and take sessions and <coughs> andy holden was a reserve team manager and he was local as well and I suppose then Oldham were in the Premier League and I got, you know, I kind of got drawn towards them, coming towards 14, which is a big stage, or was a big stage at football in them days, because that's when you signed associate schoolboy forms, you know, you're that close then to becoming a professional. Uh, and that's what I did, you know, I went and made the decision. Well, within that year, I didn't sign for anybody between 13 and 14, Liverpool, Oldham or nobody, and just went on trials pretty much like anywhere and everywhere. Um, you know, it was kind of highly wanted at, at that stage, and I and I just did, and I went, and we went to Man City, and scored five in a trial game, and then they were like, oh, they wanted another look at me, and I went home, and I was like to my dad, well, like I've just scored five, like, and, you know, they either put an offer on the table or not, and I'd got, and it wasn't like I wasn't big headed or anything, but I knew what I wanted in life, mm -hmm. I wanted to be a footballer, um, and my dad and my mum were like brilliant, they just, you know, the, the way they just helped me do anything, and I just said, look, dad, just get them to either put an offer on the table or we'll just move to the next club and went to Sheffield Wednesday and then we had like numerous offers on the table at 14 and 
But I just, I, I liked all them. I thought it was the best move for me at that stage. They were a Premier League club. They had a history of promoting their own and, and young players. And look, now as a, as a manager, you know, you, you say things. And Joe Rowe was manager at that stage. And he was like, look, I can see you playing our first team at the age of 16 if you keep progressing. He probably said that to tons of 14-year-olds, right? But obviously when I was 14, 13, 14, I didn't, you know, you just believe what, what they're telling you. And I could see that. They turned up to my house on my 14th birthday to make sure that nobody else was there. Because that was a thing then, you know, as soon as you turned 14, like you were open market, everybody could sign you, and they were at, they were at my house on the day. So I suppose that helped make that decision um, to go there. And then I knew at 14, then I, I agreed a deal to sign for them until I was 18. Two years, um, obviously two years schoolboy and the two years, two years YTS. And then that's when I started going there to play. I kind of left my sabrin behind because um, I could only play for all of them and we just played for them every every Sunday then up and down and they'd put us up in a hotel on a Saturday night myself and my dad would go and watch them play in the Premier League game whoever they were playing on a Saturday and then and then go and play the games on the Sunday and you know that was the start of it really being a you know professional footballer. So you're just starting to leave your, your local team and to sign and play for all of them uh, what was the was there big differences you noticed in maybe the quality of players you're playing with the quality of players you're playing against, what kind of was the differences between? Well, yeah, massive because everybody that you were playing were that close to becoming a professional footballer. You know, you'd, you'd be up against Liverpool, Man United, Everton, Blackburn, you know, like the top, top clubs in the in the country. So everybody was there. And I suppose the big thing, I wasn't scoring six and eight in a game, you know, but I was still scoring plenty. Like, I, I, I rarely remember not scoring a goal, you know, uh, coming home in the car and I don't remember thinking. I didn't, I didn't score today, you know, and I was still, you know, twos and threes most weeks, regardless of who we were playing. And that just continued on, and, and I remember then it was about, about the February. I was 15, you know, so I would have been six. My birthday's at the end of June, which, you know, coincides with the, the start of pre-season. So I was in the last year at school, and we went, and it was about February, and some of the players then, that's the kind of decision time, you know. I already kind of knew I had my, my YTS, I'd, I'd already agreed it. Um, but then other clubs started getting interested, you know, because I was kind of playing well. So, say we played Blackburn on a Sunday, I'd score two or three. Then, next day, you'd get a phone call, you know, people watching this, youngsters, like, it was house phones then, you know, there was no mobiles. Like, well, people, the odd person had a, a mobile in 1995, 1996, but not too many. And that started happening. And, and I think then, you know, obviously my head was turned because you're thinking, right, you know, they, they would start talking money and, and things like that. And I remember it came to a head, we were playing, uh, we played Rochdale um, in the game and, and we were 6-0 up at half time and I'd scored all six. And it, like I'd just got to, like I was at, like, you know, I suppose as an under 16, I was at the peak, I was, you know, I was flying. And their manager went round, which I didn't know, obviously don't know, but I was 15. Uh, and, and I got brought off at half time and I was raging. And I said to my dad, I'm leaving. I said, I'm not having that. I want to score 10 against them. I want to absolutely batter them wherever. And I just remember having that, that thought in my head. And then, they, like, anyway, so I, like, I was mad, obviously. I was like, you can't bring me off. Um, and, I, and I remember then the, the chief scout, Jim Cassells, came over to my dad and said, look, we've had to bring him off because the opposition, like, he's just ruining all, like, they, like basically their managers came over and said, if he stays on, we can't keep any of our team on. He's just going to keep getting the ball and just, like, taking them all on and scoring. And, they, like, we're looking to give them, like, professional contracts and he's making them look like idiots. Like, they, they'll not play football again. So, obviously, maybe in 15 and whatever, I was like, I don't care about them. You know, I want to just, like, kind of score loads of goals and stuff. And they were like, look, no. And then they, they just said... That contract that you've agreed, we're going to rip it up, and we want to give you a, a better, a better deal, um, and we want to give you the four-year deal from now, like two years YTS and a two-year professional deal, which took me up to twenty. Uh, you know, at that stage, then I was like, well, what do you think? And my dad was like, look, you really like it at the club, yes. Obviously, you're mad today because they brought you up. You just got six in the first half, um, but like, be realistic. You know, you you love everything about the club, and you know where you're going in your digs and and whatever already. So. We went home and, and I was like, uh, you know, I didn't want to leave, but we had, you know, we probably had five or six offers on the table. And I just said no. And, and then obviously we went we went and agreed and, and I went up and, and signed for all of them. And knowing then that that's where I'd be going in July. So kind of give us, well, I was going anyway, you know, 
obviously it would have been my decision to leave because we'd already agreed the previous deal. Um, but I suppose you know with GCSEs and stuff, it meant then that I could go away and well, I, I would like to sit here and lie and say I went home and you know just knuckled down and did all my revision and stuff. <laughs> but I didn't. But I was lucky enough because like school kind of half came easy to me. You know, so I never went to school on a Monday for about two years, just because I was going up and down to Oldham on the weekend and I'd come in on a Monday and whatever way I chose, I remember, you know, you do your choices and stuff and I chose something that was rubbish that I didn't like and I, and I kind of dropped it and I went in to see the school. It wasn't like I was being naughty or anything. I just went and said, look, I, can't, I think it was electronics, right? It was something I had no interest in because I was in the top set you know, A for maths and English, you kind of got, well, I had to do that, you know, like, I was like, can I not just go and, like, mess about with my mates doing woodwork, <laughs> like, they're just uh, making, like, a letterbox or whatever they were doing, they're like, nah, you can't, because you're, like, at that level, you've got to do that, but it, it was, like, by the Christmas time, I went in and I said, look, I'm never going to pass it, and it's a pain, you know, it's a Monday morning, it was, because it was, like, a double lesson or something, so my mum just said to me, you don't have to go anymore on a Monday, but you have to do your football training and stuff, and, so I never went to school on a Monday for ages, like, I hope, well, it's all right, George has left now, but if James watches it, he'll be cracking up. Um, it was just the way, you know, because I was dedicated to the football and I wanted to make sure nothing got in the way of that. You know, I came out of school with nine GCSEs, all A to C, so I wasn't, like, I don't think the school were worried about me. I think just as long as I turned up when we had a school team game, <laughs> I think the PE teacher was happy. And I went and did extra, kind of, you know, we did extra studying for English and maths and stuff you know I always would have and I never I never missed and I never messed about when I was there but it was like I'm not lying it was like it was way down on the list of my priorities at school or school years it was just football and football only mm -hmm. the odd girlfriend um, and then and then um, you know getting the schoolwork because I just like I say it wasn't it just came kind of natural to me to do the schoolwork, do the English work and the maths work, which is obviously most important and everything else. Welsh was, you know, we had to do, we had to learn Welsh and stuff. And that was probably my hardest subject because it's not first language for me. Even though, you know, it was a 50-50 school, we would have spoke a lot of Welsh. It wasn't really there, but uh, I just made sure I'd done enough to get through school so I could go at 16 and, and go and play football. So you finished school as a 16 year old and you, you head for Oldham then and that's where it kind of all kicks off for real then? Well yeah, there was a professional footballer then, yeah. That was it, that was the dream, you know, I suppose achieved. Um, and then you get, then you realise that, yes, okay, you are a professional footballer, you get paid on a, I think we were weekly basis at that stage. But then there was bigger targets, you know, you go there. And the way the football was then in, at that level, it was B team. A team, reserves first team. So the B team would have been what predominantly like a youth team. A team was the stepping stone then between them and the reserves because reserve football was real football then. It wasn't like how it is now in the 23s and the 21s and all that. It was basically whoever didn't play on the Saturday in the first team played midweek for the reserves and you would play at proper stadiums, Anfield and Allen Road, um, Ewood Park, Old Trafford. You know, it was real football and you would be coming up against these top players. So, yeah, I suppose when I got there, you know, I can either get in the B team, you know, that was the first target, um, you know, and see where we go from there. But by the time the season kicked off, we'd done pre-season, I was straight into the A team. And by the September, I was in the reserves already, and I'd only turned 16 in the June. I was, you know, I was the youngest player at the club because of the way my birthday fell at 29th of June. And it just... Football was easy for me. I just, you know, I'd never had any knockbacks, no, no setbacks. I'd never been told I wasn't good enough or... Whether that helped me, I don't know, you know, further on down the line because I didn't really need to work at anything. I just kind of turned up and played and scored. And, and that was the way it went for me. Like through the, the YTS, you know, the first year of YTS, I was there and I was kind of training with the first team by the March of that year. So I was still only 16, Neil Warner could just come in as manager and I was up with them. And then, like the same situation as obviously, you know, the year previously, people are getting told if they're going to get kept on or not. And like, there was probably, obviously, take away the first team, but you know, so the, like the year above me, so there was three strikers in our, you know, our year, three the year above, and then three the year above that, you know, that were first year pros, and and I was kind of already above them, you know, I was already playing like reserve team games ahead of these players, and and they were good players, like I mean, really, really good players. Um, 
uh, and nothing seemed to be stopping. And, and by the, the, you know, the, the end of them, they came and they said, listen, um, myself and Dave Muskelly, obviously, who's now my assistant there, we, we lived together, we were in digs together. He'd come from, from here. I'd come from Wales Magician, you know, we kind of paired up quite quickly, got really good friends, and then he, he was a superstar as well, I suppose, for want of a better term. He was flying through, he, you know, we were on the same path and we were just miles ahead of everybody else at the youth team level, um, him and goal, clearly. And uh, we both got pulled in around about the March time when, when the boys a year older and the year older that were getting told, you know, they're getting a new contract and they got us in and um, they wanted to give us professional contracts a year early. Um, you know, because really you have to wait till the end of your two years YTS. We were one year into it, one, kind of six or seven months into it, really. And uh, we both sat down then, yeah, and we, we both um, we both agreed new contracts, um, another four-year deal. So within kind of two and a bit years, I'd signed three, four-year contracts. And that carried on. By the time I left home at 22, I'd signed six, four or five-year contracts. Every year, I just got a new and a better deal because I was just obviously... So at that stage I was 16, I couldn't send it until my 17th birthday, which was, you know, in the end of June. And then, so it was four years, took me till 21. The following year I'd made my debut in the first team. I went straight, so when pre-season came, I went straight back with the, the first team. We went to the Isle of Man on a pre-season tour. Like I see them now and they're off to Portugal and all these places. We went to the Isle of Man four years in a row. But we went and Neil Warnock, like I say, was in charge and... So we went. Anyway, we were allowed out, you know, and, and the boys were like, they're adults. Like, I was just still a kid, um, 17. So we went out anyway for a drink with them. And, and I remember Lee Doxbury saying, you know, be sensible, blah, blah, blah. You know, stick with me. And when it's home time, you come on with me, right? I'll make sure you're not, you know, falling about, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, whatever time it was, I don't know. He said, him and Paul Reed, they were like, you know, Lee Doxbury was club captain. Paul Reed was a real experienced player. Right, we have to go now. But the gaffer's kind of he'll be looking there right to see who's kind of coming out this nightclub so we have to jump over this wall and we'll be all right so i've jumped and honestly it must have been i don't know how high too high for me to jump over anyway i've landed and rolled my ankle um, tore all the ligaments in my foot and they were like well, we can't tell the manager that so tomorrow you're just gonna have to get up and go to training and then pretend you've like wobbled it during training right but we had a game kind of the day after that and i wanted to play I was young, so I just kind of hobbled through training and then thought I'd be all right. And I went and played, but it was a disaster because obviously it was wrecked. I'd um, snapped all the tendons and the inside of my ankle and I was out for about six or eight weeks from that that year. But uh, then by the time I came fit, um, he put me in the squad. And about November, I think I made my first team debut away at Carlisle. I came off the bench and then had my first start. I kind of came off the bench a few more times and I had my first start away at Chesterfield in February of that year. And then that then led to another new contract. Um, and it just, I suppose that was the way it went, but it, I found it a lot harder at first team level to score. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't score for about, must have been 20 odd games like, um, before I scored. And it was in the November of that, the following year, I scored my first goal. Um, it was against Wrexham, local club obviously in Wales to us, and it was a 90th minute winner. They won goal of the month on Sky. And again, then I thought, hey, this is how easy football is. You know, this is just the way it's going to be, you know, forevermore. But it just didn't, it, it, it kind of didn't go like that. I okay, had a good career, but it didn't go the way that, the, you know, that, that I thought it was going to go at 16 and, and younger, I suppose. Because it was hard. You know, we'd been relegated from the Premier League to the Championship and then again. And we were thrown in, then Neil left and Andy Ritchie took over and, and the club was in kind of turmoil, I suppose. And, you know, when you look back now and you think I, there was a hell of a lot of pressure put on me because I'd done so well all the way through, you know, when I was kind of this, you know, the bright young thing, it, it, for want of a better word. And the, the, I, I kind of probably just, as much as I loved that pressure and I wanted to be the best player, I, kind of, I wasn't getting the chances to score the goals that could prove that, you know what I mean? We, and we had a good team there with good players. John Sheridan was playing, like I said, Lee Duxbury, Paul Reid, Toddy Augustin was there, he was a Norwegian international and stuff, but I just... We kind of just seemed to be losing all the time, and I wasn't like I wasn't getting the chances that I was used to. I suppose you know, being a being a young fella, and like I was still doing well. Like I was playing, you know, and as time went on, I obviously I did. Like it's not like I never ever scored another goal the rest of my time. I did. I was scoring, but I wasn't getting. You know, I thought like I'll get twenty easy watching this, but it was a hell of a lot harder when you're playing against like full six foot three men every week, booting you up and down the pitch, and I was only slight. Like I was 17 going in the team and I was, a, I was like a small 17 year old. It wasn't like I was, 
you know, like when Wayne Rooney broke through, that like, he was a full-grown man. Like I, like I didn't get well, not this size, at forty when I got to this size, but in terms of height and, and broadness, it was probably twenty-one before I really reached my peak physical uh, development. But I'd had a lot of football up to that age already. You know, I'd probably played a hundred first-team games by the time I was 20, 21. and that hampered me later on in my career, no doubt. And, and it's something I do speak about um, regular. <laughs> um, I do speak about it regular because sometimes they, the young kids can get too much too young and if they're not physically developed for it, it, it certainly hampers them and, and if you look at the amount of people that make the debuts young, like I'm mean, 16, 17 year olds, they don't have that longevity in their careers, you know, they finish like Gareth Bale, just there last week, 33 now. 33 is loads more he could play till you know, you see other people, but no because he played at 16, so he's had a 17 year career at like the, the, the top level, like, so 17 years, where you see some people who don't break in until 19, 20, they retire at 36, 37, it's still the same amount of games, same amount of time spent, so it's a case, everything has repercussions, so, because I was thrown in at that physically demanding age at 16, by the time I was 30, I was done at full-time football. You make your first team debut at Oldham, you play a few games, they're, re they're relegated down into the Championship and League One, your time at the club then came to an end? Yeah, um, 2002, that season. We'd started off really well, actually. Now Andy Ritchie was the manager, and that was probably our best. You know, We looked really well. New owner had took over, big investment into the club and stuff. Um, Chris Moore, it, which went to top. Um, went after I, the guy was a, a fraud, basically. He'd like put all this money in, but he didn't have any of it. Um, and it was mad, and the club went bust. But he, Andy Ritchie got the sack while we were sitting like third in the league or something. Like, going really well middle end of October but obviously new owner new chairman and all the rest of it that comes and he brought Mick Wadsworth in who'd been uh, Brian Robs uh, Bobby Robson's assistant brought in Ian Dowie with him and I thought decent training all went up a level you know it was really good um, then they brought new players in and whatever and I guess I played and I was scoring a few earlier on in the season I was scoring plenty actually but the, the longer it went I just I felt like I was getting you know moved out look football was changing as well we went to a 4-3-3 and we had David Reeves, centre forward, who was like prolific goal scorer. He was an adult. You know, I was still a cub, really, 21, but he was like 33 or something. He was brilliant. He'd scored hundreds of goals at that level. So he was down the middle and I was kind of playing off the right and the left. And I didn't really want to do that. You know, anyway, that was the way it went. And I was on the bench and I was playing. I was coming off the bench and then it was a couple of weeks. Anyway, I wasn't on the bench one week. I was, wasn't in the squad. And Ian Dowie loved running and I hated running. Um, I hated doing it when I was in the squad, you know, like, so if you didn't get on on a Saturday or you'd only played like, I think it was under half an hour, you had to do this running after the game and it was a killer. But this one week I wasn't in the squad, uh, Saturday, and we had to go in for training and run, just run. I just went halfway through, I thought, ah, this is not for me. Um, I'm putting the transfer request in. I just, he came to me on the Monday anyway and he said, look, um, a couple of clubs have been in, in for you, would you be interested? I um, mean, speaking to him, so I said, yeah, so I went, I went and met Macclesfield that night, met David Moss and thought, right, do you know what, yeah, it's dropping down the league, but I feel I can go and play and a year or two years at that level, scoring plenty, give me the ability to step back up and, and that was it. It was kind of, it was over like that, you know, my time and all, it was just conversation with the manager then, phone call at lunchtime, we had more bars then, so you could take a call whenever you were about. Went and met him that evening, and I was uh, done and dusted by the Tuesday. I was in, uh, went to Macclesfield then. Two clubs agreed, whatever. It was a nominal fee. I don't think it was big. Yeah, no, and, I, and off I went to Macclesfield for the start of well, one of my three journeys there. And I remember turning up to train on. So I must have agreed on the Tuesday. Actually thinking about it because Wednesday day off predominantly in football, um, and then and I went into training on the Thursday, ready for the game on the Saturday. I remember turning up and thinking, ah, I wonder if I can just turn around and go back to Oldham. We were training on a school pitches and there was like rugby posts there and they had to move the goals and then there was like no training kit. The socks were like old, like hard, like you couldn't put them on and stuff. And my calves are massive. I struggled in socks at the best of times and I was like, dear me, like I'd come from Oldham and as much as like I said, you know, we, we had, had a bad time, but it was still top level, you know, training pitches were always top draw and we had our own training, you know, we had two training centres, we had Chapman Road and we had one at the ground, Little Wembley it was called, but you know, the kit and all was perfect and if you, your socks are a bit hard, you just go to the kit, kit lady, kit man, 
and just get a brand new pair. And they couldn't even get me one pair of socks at Macclesfield. Like they had to then go to get, kept me had to go back to the ground to get me a pair of like match socks and all. They were probably thinking, who's this idiot? And the pitch was about this deep in mud. And I was like, what am I doing here? Um, thankfully, that was the worst of it because after that, everything went brilliantly. It took me a couple of games to get going before I scored, and, and then I scored a few towards the end of that season. And then the year after, I really, you know, really kicked on. And, and, and look, I loved my time there. I'd done really well personally. The team wasn't great the first year. We were kind of, well, first two years, to be honest, we were, you know, kind of mid to lower end of the table um, but just the way football goes that's it you know you've got to go do the best of what you can I was scoring on a fairly regular basis I think I scored 14 my first season 17 or 14 um, 14 that year 20 the year after and and, and then I, I signed another new deal there um, we got to the playoffs year after and I ended up I was captain you know I was only I was still only young I suppose I was 24 25 um, Tommy Richardson had left. He was captain previously. He left, and Brian Orton, obviously a legend in football. You know, he'd just done his thousandth game and as a manager and stuff. And then he made me captain. So, I suppose that was a big privilege. You know, I was I was delighted, and that probably was you know the start of me thinking. Then I wanted to get into the other side of it. I'd done like my uh, first coaching badge and stuff, but it, that lapsed. You know, you have to redo it. You have time, but I'd, I'd just done that then, and I was thinking about being a manager and a coach. I suppose back. 24, 25 years of age because clearly, you know, people watching it, I'm not shy of an opinion, you know, I wasn't shy to voice my opinion. Even going back, I was 17, 18, I would have stood up in the dressing room at Alderman and offered my opinion on, on different things and it, whether it's right or it's wrong, I still had that confidence and that belief to stand up in front of people to give that opinion across and I did and, and the time at Max had then, it was just, look, I just loved it. It was a real good club, they were good, George was only born, um, they made back in you know him feel welcome every week at the at the ground and stuff and I suppose it was the case of you know, I was the big player there like mm -hmm. so you know I was cleaning up player of the year awards and, and I was doing well in in the league and I suppose my, the only disappointment is I didn't really kick on from that to get a better move you know okay I made you make decisions and I probably made wrong decisions at the right time or right decisions at the wrong time or whatever way you want to class that clubs came in for me Macclesfield didn't refuse the valuation or whatever it was and then when it was time for me to negotiate like so when I was out of contract that you know I had probably three or four better clubs really but I thought you know what one year and, and you know they were offering me top money and I stayed and I just maybe I should have moved on you know that stage and then by the time then the next time I was out of contract the, the following year after the playoff defeat you know it was kind of then right I probably do need to move on and I, and I made the wrong move you know, I'll openly admit, I made it for financial reasons and financial reasons only um, to go to Mansfield. And it didn't take me too long to work out that I wasn't going to enjoy uh, playing under Carlton Palmer. I thought it was, I just didn't think, we just didn't agree on anything. Style of play, just nothing. Personal, whatever you want to call it. I just thought, no, it's not for me. So, yeah, I only lasted, um, I only lasted four games there. Um, under Carlton, just the way football goes. He just, I just thought, I just thought he was clueless, to be honest. And he probably thought I was an idiot as well. You know what I mean? He was wanting me to do stuff that, like I was like, nah, doing that. And he just, I didn't work out. You know, it just didn't. And I think that could have been a good club. And maybe I was a bit stubborn as well because, like, obviously, I'd just come from Axford where I was captain, and I could pretty much do what I wanted. And I went there and I needed a double hernia operation and now I'd needed this operation probably since I was 17. Hernia's groin's were wrecked, but I could manage it. And when you're at Marcus and you've been there for three years and you're scoring every week, I'm not training Monday, gaffer. That's no problem. But when you go to a new club in the middle of pre-season and the way that they're... Because he'd went in there later on the season previous and they were struggling, obviously, because you don't particularly get jobs in football as a manager if the team's flying up at the top of the league. So he was like, this team needs to be fit. And he brought them in like crazy, middle of June, like beginning of June. And, but my season had only finished the playoffs. Had only finished whatever the playoffs finished, you know, the 20 something of May, like right at the end of May. And then I, we were going on holidays. We went to Cuba that year with Dave and Rachel and, and obviously back in George. So we went over there. So it was while I was in Cuba, and like I was saying about mobiles, right? But it was like, then, like, 
it was like a, I don't really know. They didn't really work like they do now. You know, well, you couldn't just like pick up the phone in Cuba to answer it. And he was like, I was getting faxes and all sent to the hotel from clubs with offers. So by the time I got home from that holiday, then I had, say it was the 20th of June, 24th of June. It's like really the 1st of July is the day that you want to be sorted, you know, to go to a new club. And I was then rushing about and we'd, we'd had an offer to go to Australia. Which I probably, you know, it's easy saying now, I should have took it really because it would have been a life changing experience, but we didn't. And then I went there, but we rushed into it. You know, I wanted, Blackpool had offered me a deal, but it was half the money of what I'd kind of been on. Bounds, they were interested and they were in, obviously, they were in a higher league, but they didn't think the money was as good. And then it kind of petered out and there'd been a deal in place with Huddersfield that just fell through and I don't, I still to this day, I don't know why it had fallen through. Peter Jackson was the manager and he'd tried to sign me numerous times. Going back to my olden days and stuff, they'd tried to sign me. And that's where I wanted to go and whatever way, I don't know. I think it was something to do with John Stead. I think they were selling John Stead and they had to like wait to sell him to sign me. Well, because we were obviously two centre forwards and then, like, I don't know why. So I chose to go to Mansfield, like saying, yeah, that, that lasted four league games. Um, just went in and just said, just rip it up, I'm, I'm away. Um, and I suppose to link it to Northern Ireland, that was the first time I spoke to Ronnie McFall. David had just been here, he'd probably been here about a year then, you know, his time in Ulm had finished through injury. And he was here and he said, listen, our manager will sign you and all the rest of it. So I spoke to him then, but obviously I was 25, I wanted to keep playing and, that. and I went to Bury. But the double hernia thing, I was wrecked like, and Graham Barrow was a brilliant manager. I went in first day and scored probably one of the best goals of my career. And I think they thought, oh, he, he's flying, but I just couldn't get over this pain. So I tried to dig in, and it was about middle of December, I went and seen the surgeon. He just said to me, how are you feeling? I said, I'm in agony. Um, but you know, I'm trying to play on a Saturday and not train, but Chris Casper had come in as a new manager. Graham had got the sack. Chris was a young up and coming manager, and he had the belief if you didn't train every day of the week, you weren't available for selection on the Saturday. And there was no way I could train, like on a Monday after playing on a Saturday. And that, like Barry Stranger, like mud like this, like the pitches aren't like that now. You know, you look at them at League Two level, they're all like carpet. I'm telling you now, if people Google or whatever, go back, there's, it'll be on YouTube. Look at Betty's pitch and Olden's pitch and Macclesfield's pitches in and around the early 2000s. I'm telling you, you were running through serious mud to play a game of football. So legs were hanging off. So well, anyway, the surgeon said to me, they're the worst tears I've ever seen. He said, how long have you had this one? I was like, mm, seven years. He went, you're only 25. You should have just came in as a, as a young player. But going back to old, like they needed me in a relegation battle. Like, why, why, are they, why did they put me under that strain and pressure to play through injuries, injections and stuff at 18? But they did and I, and I just wanted to play. So Barry just injured the whole time. Came back, whatever way, wasn't really, you know, wasn't getting in the team, but Chris was under pressure. And he, um, he, had, he had no choice but to throw me in and we were away at Darlington. And if people want to look it up, they would not see my goal on there, but Chris Brass scored the best fucking goal I've ever seen. Volleyed the ball off his own face, broke his nose and it went in, right? I was on the bench that day and like, it's not funny, we needed a win to stay up. Like, if we beat, we're, we're relegated, there's three games to go and we're, we were cast adrift. Uh, and he, um, yeah, Brassy booted the ball off his own face. <laughs> it's unbelievable, there's like millions of views on YouTube, it's clap. But, like I say, probably not class if you're like the manager of that team. But I was on the bench and I actually, it's like weird on the bench, you're drinking way more water than you're playing. You're sitting there and he scored that on goal and I actually pissed myself. Just sitting there going, <laughs> I had to go in and like get, change my shorts, my slips or whatever. And uh, obviously I come back out and then uh, won a free kick. Brian Barry Murphy stuck in the top corner. And, but like we're into the injury time, corner came in, keeping my stick and I managed to do what I did best and kick it over the goal line from about three inches. And, and so we won and, we, and we, we obviously we stayed up and that was probably the highlight of my career. You know, at Berry then I went back in the pre-season, Chris said, you know, me, we get you fit. And I was, I was properly fit that pre-season. Like, I mean, I was sharp and we played Everton and scored a, a decent goal against them. And, you know, really looking forward to it. Day before the season kicks off, we were away at MK Dons. We hadn't done any shooting, which was real weird, you know. They, they were, you know, it was a lot of fitness work and no problems with that. And I hit a shot right on like the last shot of the day on the Friday before we're getting on the bus and tweak my groin again. And I think Chris just thought, get him out of my club. He's been injured all last year. And then again, and I got fit. Look, and it was only a tweak, but it just it obviously put me out for the Saturday. I was fit then for the following week, but it just, I think he just thought he couldn't risk me or whatever. And he, 
And he said, look, Brian's been on, he wants to take you back to Macclesfield. I said, no problems at all. And I went back, did that year on loan. Brian got the sack and Paul Ince came in. And he, and he was uh, he was superb with us. Um, Paul, he brought in a whole different professionalism that you hadn't really seen at League Two. We had chefs, we had masseuses, you know, just stuff that that was unheard of. Look, they all got it now, but at that stage we used to grab a sandwich or, a, like when I say a sandwich, a bacon sandwich on the way to training, you know, stop at the garage, grab that, and then on the way home again, you know, a pre-packed kind of sandwich out of Tesco or whatever it was that we were stopping. And he just said, lads, I can't be having that. You've got to be eating the proper food. So we, st- yeah, we had a proper chef come in and, and things just went up a notch. He brought a proper fitness coach in, which I hated. I didn't like, I didn't like running. Like, you know, I make no bones about that. I just like, gives a ball type of thing. And you know, that, that's built on into my career as a manager and a, and a coach, because I think you get more from players if they're working you know, with intensity with the football. Um, and that's how you get fit. Like it's proven the studies, you know, the heart rates and stuff are, are way higher when you, when you introduce a ball. But, you know, we're going back 20 years, or oh, I don't know, yeah, but well, 18, 15, 18 years. But yeah, I loved working under him, but again, like it was just constantly niggles, you know what I mean? Coming back from injury after injury, and like I hated that rehab stuff. You know, actually having to run like to get fit, and I didn't really want that. Um, and and my, my time alone was up, and I, I'll be honest, I didn't even return their calls in that summer, neither did I return Barry's calls. I just went, do you know what? I'm going to go a different route here, thought about setting up a coaching business, kind of did that tentatively, and then went part-time, because I just thought a year playing part-time would maybe help my body recover. Because I couldn't, I just couldn't train, play on a Saturday, it's Saturday, Tuesday, most weeks at, you know, League Two and League One level, and my body just couldn't do that as well as, because if you play on a Saturday, you're training Sunday, training Monday, playing Tuesday, day off on a Wednesday, or recovery day on a Wednesday, train Thursday, travel on a Friday, because you, you, you know, you. Every other game's, clearly every other game's an away game, but when I'm in an away game in England, you're going from Berry to Torquay, seven hours on the coach. Like, and that's draining, you know, and you've been doing that 10 years now. So I went, I went to Hyde part-time and loved it. Absolutely loved it, met some brilliant people. And, you know, appreciated then, again, something that's helping me, you know, as a manager or is helping and has helped. People have real jobs, like, at that level. You know, I mean, we were training twice a week, but they were training or three times a week, whatever it was, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. Um, but these boys had real jobs, like you know, carpet fitters, window cleaners. I don't know, just all like actual physical work. And I tried it myself for a wee while, but it wasn't for me that real work kind of business. And um, had a couple of little things on the go as well as playing. But look, part time over there, non league football, it was good money, you know, at that level. So I was happy enough. I didn't really need to be worried. And I could give it a go, set up a tiling business with a mate of mine. We, we did it like a summer course thing, you know, through the PFA and whatever. We did that. Another mate of mine bought a paint. He was a paint and decorator, bought a paint shop, gave me work in there. But it actually cost me more because Becky kept coming in and buying paint off from him. So I was like spending more than what he was paying me to sit in his shop all day. Helped another mate of mine do some carpet fitting for a while. But basically, all of these, they were just things for, to get me out of the house. They weren't like real jobs. I never like, had the intention of being a carpet fitter or working in a paint shop, but I was helping mates out, you know. So the carpet fitter, Gary, he, he was a professional boxer. So he needed somebody basically, you know, just to give him a, a little hand. Read the, read the A to Z, really, for Gary, and just have a bit of crack with him in the van, and we'd go for breakfast and stuff. And I couldn't fit carpets, like. <laughs> it just needs to go there, and I was crap at reading the A to Z, so uh, I'd like, I had no use there. There was no sat navs and all that then. It was yeah, reading the A to Z, so then I'd be like, I haven't a clue. And then he knew where he was going. I said, What the hell are you asking me for? Then you know where you're going anyway, you know, in and around the Manchester City Centre and stuff. So I used to have a bit of crack doing that. And, and then I did a year there, and I scored 27, I think, for Hyde that year. And then they went into a little bit of financial difficulties the following season. Uh, Steve Wavell got the sack, and it was real early, like September or something. I don't. I don't know, and Droylston had put a bid in to buy me it. And I didn't want to go, I'll be honest, didn't really fancy it. I didn't particularly like the way Droylston played football, but then Hyde came to me and said, I think they, we just sold Gareth Seddon. Um, I think he went to Kidderminster, or I think it was Kidderminster, he went to one of them teams anyway. And then they came to me and said, look, if you don't leave, um, like the players won't get paid this week, or next week or whatever. And I was like, right. So they sold me for whatever they sold, and then that kept them going. But it didn't really work for them either. And so I went to Droylston, but ugh, it wasn't the same. And I, then I was getting the itch to go back to play real football, if you want, you know, to go back to league, you know, to league football, to football league. And 
So I went to Droylsdon. I done all right there. I didn't score a pile. I should have scored more, but didn't. But done all right. We had a real good cup run. We got to the third round of the, the FA Cup before getting kicked out. People in the Irish League will love this, you know, registration technicality. So we'd played Darlington, beat them. I'd scored in that game. Then we played Chesterfield. So Sean Newton had been suspended or sent off or something, right? And he was suspended. But we played Chesterfield, but it was mad. So we played him away and the fog came down, the game got abandoned. So we had to go back and play them again. Then we drew. So that was one game, but it was two games because they abandoned him. Then we played him at home and we were losing. And then that got abandoned, floodlight failure. So then it was another game. So in amongst all this, and we'd had league games and stuff. So Sean Newton played in the, whatever, the four, three range game or something, right? But it was all these games. And, and he obviously was cleared to play. But then we drew, so we beat them. And we drew a switch in the, in the third round. But uh, like I said, there was a technicality. So one of the games that we'd played, they said it counted towards his ban. And it didn't, I, I can't remember the exact details, but basically we got kicked out. So Chesterfield went through and played Ipswich, which was a disappointment, you know, because it was massive for the club, the third round. Even like, even in the Football League, you're going at round one. So you don't always get to round three, even at, you know what I mean, at that stage. So, yeah, that was a, yeah, that was a bit of a disappointment that we, that we didn't get to play in with Portman Road and I kind of never played there. You know? And that pitch looked like it had grass on compared to the ones I'd been humping about him for the last few years. So, yeah, it was disappointing. But look, I went there and I, and I kind of come to the end of the season. I was I'd done my UEFA B um, at that stage. So the way they do it, you know, the, the week long in, in May or whatever. And, and obviously they're all pros doing it. It was through the PFA in England. And there was lads there going to be like, why are you not back playing? Like, what happened? And it's like, I know, but just whatever. And then Dave obviously went back to their own clubs because I started getting phone calls left, right and centre off clubs to say look we heard you're in good shape would you come in and do pre-season and and I knew a few lads at Accrington Stanley and they and I spoke to John Coleman and I thought you know what I reckon I fancy it so I went and did pre-season with them told Giles and I was still in the contract and said look I want to get back playing full-time and they said if we can whoever it is matches what we paid for you or whatever I don't you know we'll we'll, uh, we'll discuss it so I went and I did the whole pre-season, or a good chunk of pre-season with Accrington, and then I was there. I was actually playing cricket, because I love cricket, and um, I remember getting a phone call off the vice chairman at Macclesfield to say, listen, Tippy, we've heard you, you know, you're back, you wanting to get back, and we've heard you're fit, and you're at Accrington, and you've, you know, you've been in pre-season with them, would you, um, why, why didn't you ring us? It's just because I didn't, you know, Keith's the manager, now Keith Alexander was the manager at that stage, and I went, if Keith wants me, Terms of ring me out, you know, because what I didn't want to do was go back there because the chairman, in fact, you know, the board and the fans wanted me back. The manager, I wanted to go back because I was good enough to play. So they invited me in and I went and played and I kind of stepped onto the pitch and I felt like I belonged there again. You know, as soon as I stepped on the pitch, fans sang my name, you know what I mean? Even though it, like two years had passed since I'd left. And they just think, I can remember scoring. We played Middlesbrough, I think I hit the crossbar and then we played Oldham maybe in the friendly and we did half agreed a deal. I remember scoring like a, a decent goal and you know, I, I just felt that adulation coming back and from fans that I knew, a club that I knew and Keith was a real good guy and I obviously agreed and I went back there um, but it, like I actually took less money to go back playing in the Football League than what I'd been on um, at non-league and obviously I you know, jacked my job and well I didn't really have a job but I was doing a bit, I think I was doing actually insurance sales at, at that stage. So it's, it was like footballer insurance, basically, if they got injured, you know, the, the insurance company. So and again, it was easy, that wasn't work, because I was just picking up the phone to lads I knew and clubs that I knew. I would go and, and say, look, you can get this for the tenner a month and sign there. And, and away I went. And I, I kind of kept a little bit that going. But yeah, I went back for another year. Started off like a house on fire, was scoring most weeks. And I remember phoning Dave on a Saturday night. He was like, you know, he phoned me. Because we wouldn't have really been texting and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? Like, me and Dave never texted until about five years ago. Until I became managers and stuff. We didn't really. We would always be phone calls about five times a day. And, and I remember him ringing me on a Saturday night. And I went, Dave, do you know what? It's easy. I said, I've been doing the coaching. Kind of know what football's about. I'm 29, 28, 29, was I? 29. And I could just see the game. And I just thought, do you know what? I'm not doing. And not that I wasn't doing what managers told me anymore. I was playing my way. You know, when I went to non-league, I went, well, like, I'm a brilliant goal scorer if I get chances near the box. I'm not running around 
chasing after the ball to the left wing and right wing. Get me the ball near the goal and I'll put it in. And I did that. And that's when I went to Maxfield. I thought, I'm, this is the way I play now. I'm not 21 and trying to prove something and just going to chase the ball all over the pitch. I'm just going to do what I'm good at or what I believed I was good at. And I did that. And I really enjoyed that year. Keith died, unfortunately, in the February. Um, it was after a game we played Notts County away and I hadn't, hadn't got on. And I was, I'll be honest, I was raging. Because I thought, I score against these. Do you know what I mean? I put me on and... Um, and he didn't put me on I was waiting for him after the game and I thought oh, do you know what I'll leave it I'd kind of waited around for 20 minutes but it took you know by the time he'd done the press and the next morning I got a phone call to say he'd passed away so I was really pleased in a selfish point of view that I didn't have that conversation with him you know because I wouldn't have liked that thought of me questioning why he hadn't put me on and certainly like even then I felt that but now as a manager like if any players come to me after the end of the game, it's not the time to speak to the manager. You know, we get, we draw nil nil, so he was delighted away from home against Notts County. But from a purely selfish point of view as a player, I was like, yeah, but I'd have scored, look. but I might not have. But that's what I felt. Um, and Keith passed away, and it, and, and it was tragic. You know, it was just I remember it was heartbreaking. Gary Simpson was his best friend, football outside of football, whatever. And he couldn't even come into training. He was that heartbroken. So it, I took training. Uh, Sean Hesse and myself, we took training them for. A, 10 days or whatever it was and I really got the bug you know I was really enjoying it and I st introduced a few things that I th thought we needed um, Gary came back in and obviously took over the team and then Keith had, uh, Keith had actually said to me about becoming a player coach you know for the following season and I was like yeah delighted you know one official striker coach I was already doing it anyway I was taking them John Rooney was playing with us and I was taking a few of the young lads Emile Sinclair was playing we just sent him from Forest and like these boys had something I didn't they could run but they didn't have that finesse, you know, in around the goal, in around the penalty area, they didn't have the composure. So I started taking them for a few sessions and that was the start, you know, I was, I was taking schools, um, like I had the wee business set up going in and around um, primary schools, another mate of mine, we'd set up like a community coaching, like club thing where kids could just come, I think it was a pound or whatever, you know, six till seven or four till five, you know, whatever it was, we just paid the pitch out and the kids just dropped what they could afford, you know, to kind of just get them which we're missing now, aren't we, really? Just kids that just turn up and just play a game amongst themselves. They don't do it. It needs organised. So even though we were organising it, but it was kind of like free play football, just go pick, you know, if you turn up first and you've got a blue one and you're in red, you're on the blue, you're on the red, and the next blue kid that turns up, he's in the blue team. None of this, you know, messing about positions, just running around. And we and we really done it. And that's when, they, you know, I'd really got the coaching bug like then. You know, I was really, I was really into it and... End of the season came back. Suddenly, they were like, "Look, we can keep you on, but you'll have to take a pay cut." And I was like, "Just tell me you don't want me. I'm not that bothered. Like, um, I'll move on elsewhere." And I wasn't obviously the coaching role had then. You know, Gary wanted to bring his own people in, which is fine. And I, I wasn't. I didn't really want to be taking another pay cut, you know. Um, so, by the time came to the end then, and summer comes, the usual crack phones going flat out different clubs and I was like where do I want to go and, I, and then I remember just pick up a name here so I was out having a beer with Ian Holloway because I was doing some scouting for Blackpool at that stage a mate of mine's there he's, he's actually at Burnley now the CEO uh, Matt Williams and he, I was just doing bits and pieces you know and then he'd said we went out for a beer and we were with Ian Holloway we'd been to Wembley and stuff um, when they won the playoffs and then I said, look, what, what would you do? You know, if you're in my shoes, I said, look, there's managers there that I've tried to sign with previously. Do I ring them back and say, are they interested? And he said, well, what's the, what's the worst that's going to happen? They're going to say no, and you're still sitting at home waiting for the phone to ring. Or they might say, go on. So I thought, well, Peter Taylor would try to sign me like every club he'd been at, you know, Hull, um, Gillingham, I can't even remember, whatever he'd been. I don't think he tried to sign me for Leicester. They were good. But <laughs> kind of the shit teams at my level he tried to sign me for. So I phoned him. Out of the blue, and I just said, listen, Peter, it's Matthew Tipton. I uh, hope you don't mind me calling. You're at Bradford City now. Um, I'm out of contract at Maxfield, but any opportunity? Were you any interest? He said, yeah, come and see me tomorrow. I went in and I did pre-season with him, and I loved it. And I, He was a brilliant coach, and I thought, do you know what? I think I'm, gonna, I'm getting a deal here. And obviously, I was playing for free, you know, or training for free for the first month, whatever it was, and he came to me. One of the players got sent to prison, sent a forward. He was a real sharp. <laughs> running in behind striker which I wasn't no more and he just said to me listen Matthew with him going to prison I can't like you were coming in to play alongside him I'm now going to need to bring in like they had we need to bring pace pretty much and unfortunately <laughs> no siree and he said but what I will do he said um, 
Ian Foster was on to me, seeing that you were training with us. He's at Dundalk. Would you have any interest in speaking to them? So I said, yeah, tell, tell Fozzie to ring me. So he did, and nothing happened, I'll be honest, you know, for about a week. I was like, what am I going to do? I was just kicking around, and, and like I said, pre-season was going on. Back in, my mum and dad and, and sister-in-law, they'd booked to go away somewhere, the Caravan Park in Wales. So I said, oh, go on, I'll jump in and go with you. And at that stage, Matt phoned me, and he said, listen, Ollie said, do you want to come in and do some coaching with our 18s reserve team? And you can sign. He said, he knows you've got your sports masseuse. Um, I'm qualified in that treatment of injuries through, through massage or whatever. And he said, so he just said, basically, getting a job, doing a bit of everything. Bit of coaching with the youths, play for the reserves. Like, I was not playing for the reserves to get into there if they were in the Premier League at this stage, but they didn't have a massive squad. And, you know, they, in the Premier League, Reserve League, they might have been away at Arsenal on a Wednesday night. And he said, you can just play, like, help the young lads. And that's so why I was like, do you know what? Sounds all right. She said, right, well, we have a game at Crew tomorrow night. So it was a Monday, Tuesday night at Crew. Come and play. Like, I was playing for Blackpool first team at this stage at Crew. He said, you might only get 20 minutes. He said, but I know Dario always talks about you. Maybe he'll, if he sees you stripping out for us, he might offer you something. So I said, you know what, I'll do that. Because I gave him Foster the phone. He was like, oh, I need to ring you back. And, you know, like, I know the way football works. It takes time. Anyway, next thing, Fozzy rang me and said, listen, we've got it sorted now. The deal's in place. I'll email it over. Do you want to come? And I went, yeah, do you know what? Yeah, I do. I said to Becky, look, it's something different. I'm going to go over there and go and play. And, I, and, I, and that's how, obviously, I ended up at Dundalk. And like, should I have stayed and, and done the Blackpool thing? It would have been amazing, I'm sure, you know. But I just wanted to play. And, and I came to Dundalk. And it was only... And the good thing was, or the bad thing, whatever way, summer football. And I was going there at the end of July. So I knew, worst case is, it was all of August, all of September, all of October. I'd be home in November. And the Blackpool thing might still be there if, if I so wanted. So that's what I did, yeah, I went um, and I went to Dundalk for, for the last 11 or, uh, 11 or 12 games of the season, I think, and really enjoyed it there. It was, uh, I left back in the kids at home and had three months by myself um, in the pubs and clubs of Dundalk for three months. And then I was t coming up and down the road here as well, because obviously Dave was here. So we'd play on a Friday night, I'd go out in Dundalk on a Friday night, get in the car on a Saturday, drive to wherever Dave was playing, or drive up here if I had time and go and watch Dave play and then have a few beers with him on Saturday night and then drive back down to Dundalk for training on a Monday. So uh, it was brilliant time and, and some real good players at Dundalk at that stage. Like Danny Kearns had just come back from West Ham, and some player left. Um, and re really enjoyable and I scored goals. You know, I'd done really well. I scored a hat-trick against Shamrock Rovers. And at that stage, I was obviously coming up to Port Down to watch Dave play, talking to Ronnie uh, McFall. And he's like, well, would you sign, you know, for us? I went, yeah, put the money on the table, Ronnie. I'll sign if you know what I told you. Just a bit of crack. And then, like the way it was, we'd maybe train Monday and Tuesday down there and then have a Wednesday off, train Thursday, play Friday in the league. And so I'd come up here on a Tuesday afternoon after training with Dave and then go down to their training and join in with them. So I just wanted to run around and kick a ball or whatever. And I'd, I jumped in there training, like, loads. Like, and... Uh, and Ronnie fancied me as a player. And I remember he, he said to Dave, and I said, look, we're playing on Monday night against Shamrock Rovers. live on the TV, but I'll put, tell Ronnie I'll put him two tickets on. And then after that, it's a year on air. I want to know if he's signing me or not. And like I said, Scott hat trick. That was their first defeat in 25 games or something. Um, and <laughs> Dave phoned me straight after the game. I was actually driving, looking for a, you know, for a pub, for a pint. I just got a hat trick. Like, I couldn't get to sleep and nowhere open. I didn't want to go nightclub or anything. I just fancied you know, a couple of pints in bed, but nothing was open. And Dave phoned and he went, well, how'd you get on? So I said, I won five one. He went, yeah, right. He did. I said, I'm telling you. I said, ring Ronnie and ring me back. See what he says. So he rang me back and he went, hey, your dad's got a hat trick. I said, I know. I'm going to lie to you. I'm not making it up. Like, and he said, hi, Ronnie says, like there'll be a deal on the table for you in the next couple of days. So I went up and obviously came up, met Ronnie and, and pretty much agreed uh, to that I would come to Port Down and then it was then saying to Becky when I went home, look, we're gonna move we're gonna have to move over. So kind of was spending time then I was more time, you know, up here looking for houses and stuff and then thankfully one came up around the corner from Dave. Just like out of the blue, we'd I'd been at the estate agent and the estate agent said to me, My cousin's house is empty. He's looking to rent it out. Give me a ring, this is his number. I rang him and that was it, done. So we moved in there. Yeah, and then that was it. We came up, we, we moved over as a family. We just felt I didn't want to be one of the players that flew in and out on a weekend. I didn't, I didn't think it would suit. Plus, Becky didn't believe that I would get on the flight home. Being honest, she knows what me and Dave would like. And 
I think she just felt that there would be too many missed flights on a Saturday night because we'd stopped for a pint on the way home and missed it because we formed for doing it. We've been doing it since we were 16. You know, wherever we go in the world, like we miss flights, cars break down, we lose cars. Like we went up to Rangers at one stage and um, I can't remember, whatever it was, I can't remember who they were playing. Aberdeen maybe on a Sunday and we went up on the Saturday night and Dave said, no, what we'll do, we'll park the car now. So before we go out and then we stay at the hotel and then tomorrow after the game at Ibrox, we'll like the car will already be there. Save us panicking tomorrow morning to drive it. Good thinking, Dave. But then we couldn't remember where <laughs> we parked it. <laughs> we were walking around uh, we were walking around Glasgow. I'm not joking, a couple of hours and ah look, so many things would happen. Like we'd go to these places and like we'd park the car at the airport, leave the inside light on, battery dead and you know, we're getting home and miss buses to get back on ah, just just madly, just so many things that would go on. So yeah, Becky, I think, just said, you'll never come home, like, on a Saturday So just, and there was loads of Tuesday games as well. We were in the Satanta Cup at that stage, and, you know, there's Cup games in Mid Ulster and, and League Cup games and stuff. So we, yeah, we decided as a family to move over. And again, it was, that was the first time we'd moved. You know, I'd always been in around Oldham in the Northwest. And I suppose if I'd have shown the same willingness to maybe move 100 miles across England, it would have opened up more opportunities over there. But for us, well, you know, now it was the best move away. We're 12 years here now. Um, the boys, like James has only turned 13, so he was just, he was 15 months when we moved in. He doesn't know no different, you know. He, um, he's always lived here and he, and he loves it. And George, you know, came and George obviously representing on that and stuff at a younger age until it got to the stage where he couldn't because obviously he's not, wasn't on that age and he hadn't, um, he hadn't declared yet what he was going to do. Really, he was born in England and I'm Welsh, so he never he, legally he couldn't play. You know, once he gets to 16 or whatever. But yeah, we've been here yeah 12 years. So then Portadown was, I loved it there. Like I just went, and Ronnie was my type of manager. Didn't really care what happened on the training pitch, and the team was just set up to create chances. And all I had to do was just kick him over the goal line pretty much and, and I came and I was 30, 30, coming up to 31, I knew where I was at in my life, my career, I knew what I was about and the boys knew and I wasn't obviously frightened of voicing that, you know, I just said look, Kevin Branagh was brilliant, you know, Wesley Boyle brilliant, Jamie Tonley came this year after, Sean Michael, Neil McCaffrey, they, like we had ability, they owned the team fullbacks and Ross Redman, I was like, if you get the ball in the box, the closer to the goal the better, I'll be there, and he said, but, you know, and, and that was the way it was and I just, you know, I just scored, and I and I loved it, and they they, they put chances on a plate for me, like, and and it was just a case of me knocking them over the goal line, and I thankfully I did that. So there's always been that wee link between this country and yourself through obviously mm. David Muskelly and and various things. Yeah. Uh, you came over, you played for Dundalk and in, in the south, as you've said, poured down, and did you know what was the differences between? Football over here and football back in your home country. Um, well, obviously not full time. That's the big. That's the big one. I think ability wise, and I like that Portland team there would have battered the Macclesfield team I left um, six months previously. Like I, there's no doubt in my mind, it's, if that Portland team had just lifted up and went and played full time league two, they'd have been in the top half of the table, as would the Linfield team and and the teams here. But just based on, on just the ability, yeah. They, them players there would walk into like League Two teams. Like I would look in you know Kevin and stuff. Give it, but the problem is in England, it's all about physicality and you know endeavour. You know, basically people like managers would say to me, "I wasn't in the team because I didn't do anything apart from score goals." Like which was just mental. Like, well, that's my job. To score goals, I know, but you don't offer us anything in the defensive third. Like you can't like head it and clear it and stuff. And I went, mm, I can't, I just don't want to. This is pointless, me running around in the middle of third of the pitch. Like I'm dead good in there, half. Um, but that was the way football is and was over there. You know, where here, people, it, for me, people looked like they were allowed to express themselves and they play with the freedom. You know, there's titles to be won and European places to be gained, but it was a hell of a lot of freedom. Certainly that, when I came here then, it was very open and expansive football, which suited me to a T. And I was fit, and no, I kind of know I keep going on about how I hated training and how, you know, I was lazy or whatever, I wasn't really, like, um, and compared to 90% of the league, I was fitter than them. 
fitter, quicker, stronger because I'd been a footballer for 15 years. You know, in England, I'd been full time, and when I moved here, I'd, like no job or anything. It was just only football, so I'd go the Billy Neil playing fields along there. I'd just take a bag of balls and go there myself on a Monday during the day because that was what I found difficult training at seven o'clock at night. Like my, I want to go to bed at seven o'clock at night. I wasn't used to it, like because obviously you know it was conditioned to train in the morning. So I, I stuck to the training in the morning routine, and I carried that on all the way towards even when I finished at Ballymena. I used to go there with like Steaky McBride, Johnny Taylor and stuff. They'd you know take a Friday morning off work and we'd go and just knock a ball about and crosses and play, getting on like kids really playing crossing and finishing, you know. Um, and, and that's I suppose the love of the game and the enthusiasm. The, I, I think that the actual uh, the freedom to play was a big difference I felt you know compared to today. it wasn't so much you weren't drilled down on tactical play all week because that's what it is you know what I mean when you're full time a lot of it is time filling <laughs> but that was the first thing I noticed that you could just basically wear better than them go and play get the ball wide get crosses in give Matthew and Kevin the ball in the final third and, and off you go and I love that yeah Coming up towards the end of the season, my contract was up Linfield. Numerous clubs had, the way that it works, somebody had put letters in to speak to me and I was looking at Linfield and I went, they're the most successful club in the country, they're winning you know, leagues and cups every year, something you know, I, want to, I want to achieve and I, went, and I went and met them and decided pretty much within five minutes of speaking to Big Davey that that was the place for me. Went in, good club, good environment, good, you know, everything was just built for success there and you know, chance to play in the Champions League and stuff um, but unfortunately just I got injured real early there I'd probably the year before at Port Down which I didn't touch and you know broke my collarbone and came back and played three weeks later I wasn't fit to play like but I wanted to play because I felt we were successful and we were struggling for bodies and I thought oh, strapping he'll be all right and I was but that then had a knock-on effect because I wasn't you know I was playing games with calves were getting tight and um, I, and, I, and I missed a few games through that and then when I went to to Limfield Look, it's all right now in hindsight, 10 years down the line, and I'm, you know, I'm 42 now, I'd have probably said to Davey, Davey, I don't think Europe's right for me at this stage. I probably needed a longer build-up into pre-season. I don't think I'd given myself enough of a break from the previous season. You know, we went straight on holidays, well, went on holiday with, with Dave and the lads, whatever, and then came back and me and Beck and the boys went to Portugal for a couple of weeks and straight from that into pre-season training at the beginning of June. And obviously I was desperate to play in the... European games and never played in Europe so I was desperate for that at the beginning of July but really you know like I say it's hindsight it's a wonderful thing now when if I, if Matthew Tipton went back to Linfield then I would have just said David can I miss Europe give myself a couple of weeks off and then go in and just do pre-season ready to start the league campaign and Linfield would have seen the better of me from that but I didn't because I was stupid or not stupid I just was eager to play and I went in and played when I wasn't like I wasn't conditioned to play, and my body needed rest. Like I know all of these values. I've I've done so many courses on, you know, on rest and recuperation and how footballers get the to be peak fitness. Going in after two or three weeks off doesn't help. It happened at Ma Mansfield. You know, when we go back to there because I did the same there. A new club, and I hadn't had enough time off. You need, you know, your body needs that time to to regenerate the muscles and stuff. And I hadn't, I didn't do that. Foolish because I just thought oh, I'll be all right for I want to play. And I played a couple of games in Europe, but I wasn't right. And then I got injured and then I did my knee. And I was out for a good while. I don't think I really came back until the end of middle of December at Linfield. So it didn't, you know, it didn't, it didn't get going for me then before I really played. And it was, it was Christmas Day, day before me and said, listen, don't be having too much turkey. That, um, you're playing tomorrow and playing Boxing Day. We beat Glen Torren in your big, big two game, big game on Boxing Day. And then we played Glen Avon on the 28th. And that was when I scored my first goal. And, uh, and after that, you know, I hit a real good run of form. I got player of the month and stuff in January. Scored plenty then between then and then. I don't know, I think I ended up with about 15, but it wasn't as prolific as obviously what had been at Porter Down. And then, you know, we didn't win the league and, and that was a big disappointment the year after then. You know, Cliftonville had a real good team that, that stage and they blew us out of the water, to be honest. That's the way football goes. Um, two years were up then, David came to me in the summer and he said, look, it hasn't really worked in the first year. Um, you know, I'm going to put you on transfers. I said, you can put me on transfers, I'm not going anywhere. I said, I'm too good. I know that I'm good enough to play for Linfield if I'm going to do my own pre-season. I know what I need to do and I'll be right. And if you don't pick me for the European game, so be it, but I'll be fit. But I'm going to do, kind of, I'm going to give myself the break and I'm going to go through my own programme this year until we're back in. 
and that's what I did. And I came back and I was fit and I was sharp and, and I done I had a better year. I wasn't you know, I wasn't as good as I could have been. But whatever and then Davy obviously halfway through the year said he was leaving come the summer. And and it was strange, you know, and then that, that stage I'd obviously done my A licence and stuff and I was getting I suppose I was getting a bit of recognition as an up and coming coach, um, through my through my work with the young footballers of the like I was in at Ridgeway, I'd done stuff at Portadown, and I was in at Ridgeway, and we were producing players. And like I don't know how things like this work, but you know, I was getting calls, and I started doing TV and radio and and different media things. And I'm guessing people obviously liked what I was saying about football, and that was getting me a, a reputation as you know an up and coming kind of potential manager. Rather, and I obviously had that ambition doing the A license. I, I hadn't made no secret of the fact that when my career was over, I would I would want to go down that route. And working under Davy for two years was massive because you know you learn a hell of a lot off something like that. And you know I still see the lads now and they say, hey, "Flip me, it's the first time seeing you not outside Davy's door." I'd be outside his door every Thursday, and I think they thought I was going into Rant and Rave where I wasn't in the squad on a Saturday, but it wasn't. I would go in and whether Davy knew I was doing it or not, you know. But for ten minutes, I would just pick his brains about stuff, you know. And I, like I probably went in with a question like, "Why am I not starting?" or why I'm in the bench or, or whatever or to, to discuss an injury and then I would start questioning him about and that was obviously just to kind of gain me bits of knowledge yourself you need to be an idiot if you don't want to learn off David Jeffrey Ronnie McFall there who was the longest serving at this stage and then obviously if David the most successful and, and I just wanted to learn off these people you know and and take things there look you've got your own ideas and I had my own belief in as a coach what I was doing you know whatever but still you want to learn off these guys about all different things you know I would ask David how come he, that young lad's not going out on loan oh, do you know what I mean none of my business really yeah. and I'll not say the answers that David would give me but it would, he'd give me the answers and I would take that on board um, you know I'd go home I'd write it up in my book or on a scrap of paper you know when I was in the car I'd get in and I'd think oh yeah that that was a good point or even like after the training session I'd think and I would like ask why are we doing this at training they, they, like Alfie Wiley probably hated me like like why are we doing this session but my point was like like what because I didn't know like it wasn't like I wasn't asking why are we doing it like out of badness I was meaning like so we're doing this but what that like what what's this kind of leading to on Saturday mm -hmm. you know because well that was the way I was as a player and that's the way I am as a manager now I don't see the purpose of just doing something if you're not going to do it on a match day it's like trying to make everything match you know that relates to the game you, you'll have seen the sessions obviously you, you're at um, Warren Point when I was taken and we, you were the 20s and I was the first team manager and I always trying to think right we're doing a possession practice but are we just passing it around for the sake of passing it around we're like we need a purpose to this and can we lead to something and I used to ask all these questions like I said they probably hate me probably thought I was alright no. but I wasn't doing it to belittle them I was doing it to try and learn and, and educate myself and you know obviously he left then and then Warren Feeney came and I knew Warren from playing in England and I was never getting another, there was no way Lemphy would give me another contract on the money I was on because I hadn't given them anything back in two years and the club was getting restructured the way that they were doing things and yeah, a few clubs rang me and Glenn for me, for, obviously it's good to Ballymena and, and knew Glenn from personally, you know what I mean, as outside of football as well as, as playing and he was a legend and I just thought, Do you know what, I'll go and play and, and it was a stage, again, the coaching was taking over, I had my business and stuff and, and I was doing tons with you know, with the kids, and I just thought, yeah, it was good, and I, and I again thoroughly enjoyed my time at Balamina for the for the two well, two years I was there, but like I, I retired um, in about the March of the season. There, Glenn had the sack. I took the team for a couple of weeks while they were waiting for Dick, Big David to take the job, and I took them while Davey was waiting for Brian then to leave Glen Abbott to come in. I, I took some training sessions for him and stuff, but I wasn't going to play. And I went into Davey and I said, look, I'm not going to play. My knee's knackered. I can play on a Saturday but I can't do anything and like you're coming in you're a new manager to the club you go, I know the way that you want your training like I'm like there's no way I'm training with that intensity like I'll go on the training pitch I'll be stood there I'll like I'll be there but I'm not I'm not running around and I know that's what you want and it might not set a good example to everybody else like the most experienced player at the club isn't really willing to put the work and I said it's not that I'm not willing but if I do that I'll be no use on a Saturday so it's up to you what and then he said right well just no I want you to stay and then on the we trained and I well, hadn't trained wherever and he asked me to go to Warren Point to play in a reserve game on the Saturday. I said no initially. And then I phoned Dave and you know, I was like, Big Dave has asked me to go and play in the reserves. Like, I said, McLaughlin's just phoned me, I've told him to stick it. I'm not going 
What's the point? Like, my point was today, if you need me for 20 minutes, I'll come off the bench against one point at home. We were in the bottom six, we were struggling, and I'll do something. But, like, what the hell use am I going to... But anyway, I went. Dave said, look, don't be so stupid. Don't be falling out with David. Go down and play. And I went and played in the reserves at one point and scored a hat-trick. But I think Marcus was there. Um, and I think he'd seen the way I was on the pitch. I was basically coaching Marsh. the... Marcus Woods? Yeah. yeah. I think he was taking them at that stage. Well, he was definitely there anyway. Um, and I was basically coaching the team while playing. Um, and I did that. And I think he went and said to Barry, um, you know, and that set the wheels in motion, obviously, for me to go there because... I played that game on the Saturday, couldn't train, I just went to Davy on the Thursday. George had actually played, was away in, with Northern Ireland playing in, in some, and he played Barcelona or Real Madrid, one of the two. And I thought, you know what, I should be out there watching that instead of sitting in the treatment room at Balamina with my knee, you know, up like that. I saw it and stuff, so I just went into Davy and I said, I'm retiring. He went, what's my head? I went, nah, that's me done. And he said, see the wages for the next two months. I said, put it in the pot, do what you want with it. I said, give it to the lads as a win bonus. I said, I don't care. I said, I'm not going to ask for any money. I said, I'm just going to wrap it. And he said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. I haven't thought that far ahead. I said, I don't particularly need, you know, I don't need this drive up and down here with my knee throbbing and knowing I'm not going to play on a Saturday. I said, look, if you need me to go scouting or I'll stay registered and if you have a couple of injuries and there's, you know, you need me to sit on the bench for a game or whatever, no problems at all. But no, I can't be um, committing to this anymore. So that was it. Yeah. Threw the boots in the bin. Well, didn't throw them in the bin. Went home and uh, told Becky that's me done. And I, uh, I had a couple. Of, came here. It was a, it was coming up to Easter actually. So I said, you know what we'll be able to do, Becky? We'll just go out for a meal on Friday, which we've never done in in all that time. And we came. And we were going out a few afternoon pints Friday. So we came here to meet the lads at lunchtime. And the flipping place was closed. Cause it was Good Friday. <laughs> so I didn't even get you know. Yeah, yeah, I didn't even get that. And that was it then. So I suppose, and then Barry rang me in the summertime. Yeah. To ask would it be interested in meeting him met him really impressed with what he had to say and he just said to me look I'm going to give you free reign come design the whole pre-season do what you need to do take them I went I've never obviously managed or coached at this level he said don't worry about it just go and work away and he just gave me carte blanche to go and work away any players that I thought we could sign go and sign first one was Conor McMenamin just said Barry need to sign this fella he said he's Brilliant. I said, he, honestly, he'd be the best player in the country, but he's mad. He'd been let go from Linfield because he told me he was at his granny's funeral or somebody's funeral, and it was about the 12th time. And he was at the dart at the Odyssey, and they were 180 sign on him, and he got caught doing that. And he fell out with them. He'd fallen out with Glenn Torren. He'd been there, and they'd released him, and he was just knocking about. And he could have been lost to football, I suppose. That's them. Not saying I, not saying I rescued him by a long stage, um, but you know, maybe somebody else but probably wasn't willing to touch him. So I brought him in. That was my first one, Liam McKenna and a couple of others that we brought in. And, and Barry had a decent squad there. Aaron Trainer signed. Um, and I was there. I did the whole pre-season. Stevie came in, Steve McDonald. We'd done that. And Barry just left us to it on training pitch, to be honest. And then so about a month into the season, two clubs had approached about me taking over as manager. And I went to Barry and I said, listen, I've been offered two jobs now. Uh, one of them, I haven't said no yet, I'm going to go and speak to them um, tomorrow or whenever I'd arranged. Um, and Barry said to me, don't do that, I'm stepping down. So I said, when? And he went, right now. He said, you didn't realise we brought you in and whilst you were assistant, you'd be the manager for the whole pre-season. I have other things going on and I want you just to take the club forward. So I was like, right, now I have something to think about because... The other club was in the Premier League and, and, and obviously were on point in the Championship and we'd only started the season and we hadn't had a great start to be honest. I think we, beat, we won the first day, we were beat at Armagh City I remember and beat or oh, drawn a couple you know and we won a couple and we drawn a couple it was only like say four or five games in and uh, yeah we went up to Institute I remember and that was kind of the first day and, and I took the team. And having that draw, I know you're obviously a confident person and, and you uh, you bat your ability and, and stuff, but how do you feel just having that? Did you have, yeah, they was giving me a real like big yeah. thoughts. Did you, did no, not you at all. Think, no. Oh no, I'm not ready for it. Or did you? Were you all in? No, I was just went all in. Look, I suppose it was a new club and never knew. But I'd been taking training at Palomino previously, and footballers don't lie to you. Like you know what they're like. They're ruthless, right? And they're not going to say to me, oh, that was a good session just to make me feel good because they don't care because all they care about is on a Saturday that they get three points. They don't, as much as I thought, right, that was a good session, right? And like, you know, maybe other coaches, they, oh, that was good. And they maybe tell you things that you, that they think you want to hear. Players don't do that. 
you know straight away if you're putting a bad session on. Like you can just see the feedback from the players. You don't need, you don't need them to tell you. You just know, you know, the, the buying. And I just remember, and there was players at Ballymena that were, you know, good experienced uh, players like Jim Irvin and that. And he, Tony came. I remember was they were just like, no, that train's brilliant. That's what we need. And 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 then so I kind of had that kind of confidence anyway. But it obviously had only been coaching um, youths, and then. Just prior to going in, at one point I'd agreed to help uh, Andy Hunter just taking over to manage the county Antrim team, and then he said to me, "Would you just do all the coaching?" He said, "I haven't a clue about coaching, but," and myself, Winky Murphy, and Winky was the same. You know, we, we were kind of starting out. Winky obviously was a bit older than me, but he wasn't really bothered about the coaching. But because I'd done loads of coaching with the kids, they just kind of let me do it. And I was like, "Flipping now, <laughs> right? All right, I'll do it." And Dave came in as well, and, and Davey Lima. We had a brilliant like the backroom team would have probably beaten their team, you know what I mean? But we had Dave in goal and Andy and and Winky could have played centre half, and me and and Dave and Tim Mounty could have played a midfield, whatever. And it was good crack, looking be brilliant, and and we went on obviously to win it, uh, the first county team to win that the Premier section. So that again, you know, boosted me. You know what I mean? It caused it. You get in that belief and. Yeah, and, and it just it just took off. At one point, obviously, we won the league. I can never lost the game for six months. It was mental. Like, how do you not lose a game of football for six months? Like, so probably going back to the beginning of my playing career, it's the same. And like, I wasn't used to, you know. And I was that confident then of just saying, just go and play, boys, because I backed myself. I hadn't didn't want used to didn't like never lost, so it didn't matter. And all right, it was at the championship level. Like we got beaten, my very first official game was Ballymena in the Cup and we got beaten that, but that was a Cup game, you know, we, we weren't expected to win, but everything else, yeah, we just won. Never lost a league game for six months until the day we went to Ballyclare away and we needed a point to win the league. Like, I was flapping, we had nine games to go and we were 18 points clear and I was panicking that we weren't going to win the league. Like, see if that was there, uh, you know, it was mental. And we, um, we conceded in the 90th minute to lose and I was like proper panicking that we weren't going to win the league. And obviously we did it like two weeks later or something. But it was just a brilliant experience, you know, and Barry took a lot of pressure off me because I didn't have to, like, deal with boards or anything. You know, I just used to bring Barry and had the players, I think I brought two or three in in the January. If, if that, promoted a lot of the young lads. I'd give Larkin Ford his David at 15. I loved Larkin working with him. And, and we had players that just played with freedom, which suited me, you know, as, the, as a new manager. You know, Stephen Murray was flying up front. John McGuigan was there, you know, went in and Barry was saying... John McGuigan's energy, but he needs to play behind the ball because he can't finish. And I was like, well, one thing I can do is finish and I can teach people. Like, not you can't teach them that knack of goals, but if you keep getting in there enough, it'll work. And I worked with John a ton. And all I used to do with him was just send him about 10 yards from the goal and I just roll the ball to him, let him kick it in the empty net just to get that feeling of scoring. And he went on and had a brilliant season, scored a bundle of goals, obviously moved on then. He went to Glen Torren before moving out to Australia, but John was dynamic for us. You know, Lork and Rory Cross could be brought in, who was probably three stone overweight in his own admission. Um, but a tremendous football, you know, ability hanging out with him. Conor Mack, Aaron Trainer was bombing forward from the left wing, you know, and we just had a real good team. Liam Bagnell was just glued to it all because he was just sit there and let all these lunatics run all over the pitch and, and just play. I had my fullback bombing on. Liam McKenna was there as a kid who had brought, because he'd won the, the Milk Cup or the Super Cup with us, and I thought I could get something out of him, and, and Liam done really, really well for us, and brought him to port down, and just teetered out at the end, probably because he was getting frustrated, he probably thought he was going to go up and up and up, and it, and it just wasn't, it just didn't, he gets frustrated, he's now out in Australia, but it was such a team we had, and, and I would have loved to have seen if we could have kept all of them together to go to the Premier League, mm -hmm. but when, as football happens, you know, people, like say John went there, Liam went to... Um, England, Dermot McVeigh went to finish his studies in England. Darren King couldn't, didn't want to commit to Premier League football then, he, you know, and he had a different job. So he went back to playing at Newry, who were, were way down the leagues. They weren't even in the Championship. Um, and we lost, you know, we just felt then we lost. And we, we brought like good players in. Darren Murray came in and had a brilliant start to the Premier League season. We sold him to, to Crusaders in the January. And we. But it was just such a good place because, like I say, because Barry was there taking all that off me. But then Barry left to go and be Cliftonville manager, and then I then had to start doing the other side of it. And you know, I'd obviously, and I'm not stupid. I know how to to deal with people um, in terms of boards and things. And Connor was super with me. But the opportunity came to go manage Portadown, the club that brought me here, and a big club. There's no two ways about it. They're a massive club, and I felt if we got them promoted, 
at that stage they could kick on in the Premier League and go up and up. But I always felt with Warren Point it'd be a battle. How do you look back in your time at Warren Point? Brilliant, I loved it. I thought we were successful. I thought we brought good players to the club who have gone on from there to be successful elsewhere. That was probably my main reason why leaving. Because I never felt, I always felt it was a, a club that players come to to play for a year or two to move on to somewhere better. Yeah, Pretty much, you know, like I said, we brought Darren in, scored a load of goals, and then he went to Crusaders. Stephen got sold to Glenavon in the January, you know, and then you look around, Connor obviously went on and, and has done what he's done since he left there. Liam had left to go to, Liam Bagnon had left to go to Clifton Mill. Shana Foster then went on to Clifton Mill. Danny Wallace is at Glenavon and doing really well. Lorcan. Lorcan went to Linfield in that, no. So when I left in there in the summer, the exodus probably happened just after, but I, I'm not stupid, I could see that coming. Mm -hmm. And I, be it impatience, I just didn't feel like I wanted to be a manager that wanted to rebuild the team every two years mm -hmm. or every year, you know, and that's what happens. You know, they'd leave because they come there and we weren't paying big wages and other clubs could probably offer double what we were paying. And on they went and that's, you know, I, I understand that's football, but I felt that like if I went to Portland, I could build something. They had a, a youth structure that I'd been involved with five, six years previously, so I knew a lot of the kids that were coming through and ready to, to burst into the first team. I'd seen a ton of them playing you know, at youth and reserve level because kind of I would be out watching matches during the week and, and it's, it was a club that I knew and people I knew there. So I knew a lot of the players and I just felt if I went there and left Warren Point at that stage, we were safe from relegation. Well, all right, not mathematically because there was 10 games or whatever, but we were kind of nine points clear, you know, we were not going to get caught. And I just felt the, the opportunity to go to Porter Down was was a big, you know, a big, yeah, good, good to turn down. Yeah, because I felt I could could move them forward, and uh, as as happened. So you moved to Porter Down, and just you're what about a year and a half into management and seniors, probably yeah. by now. Uh, having worked with so many good managers throughout your career, was there wee bits and pieces you were taking? You know, you said you worked with Paul Ince across the water. You yeah. Said you worked with David Jeffrey, Johnny McFall. You throughout your career were you taking wee bits and pieces from them and kind of like building your own like personality of a man? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and I think what I learned quickly is, and I learned this as a player, but obviously as a manager, it's it's a value I hold high. Um, you need the players more than they need you. You know, I've never seen a club sack twenty players yet, but a manager gets the sack. You know, and and I'm open and honest enough to admit that within football, if you become a manager, you're going to get the sack. You know, there's no two ways about that, and I. People think that's a cynical view to look at it, but look, I've been in football all, we've been here for an hour or an hour and a half, whatever, talking about it. That's the reality of football, you know, and you're going to move on. Like, and I always said to clubs, don't get personally attached to me, be it as a player or as a manager, because if a better offer comes on, I'll probably take it. Or you might get a better offer, as in we're getting beat, and you might think another manager's better than me, and you're going to sack me. And don't get too personal in that, and don't worry about it, don't... Like, don't get this, you know, don't make a drama out of this. This is what's going to happen in football. And, and that's the way I've lived my football life. Because I know that one day, as happened at Oldham at 21, 22, I went, I, did, I wasn't happy with the training on the Saturday, but come the Monday, I was out the door. You know, that's how quick it happens. You know, you're getting transferred that. You know, the, all of the times at Left Mansfield, Berry and all these other clubs, you go in one day and you, you're the Berry footballer and the next day you're the Maxton footballer or whatever. And as a manager, you go in one day and the next day you're out of work. Um, and, and like I have no I have no issues with that. I went in there knowing and look I gave them four good years. I think I, I brought them from where they were and I moved them up and promoted all the youth at Port Down, which is what they were asking me to do when I went in there. You know, we brought Lee Bonus in from amateur league football and sold them for a hundred thousand pound. So people might want to try and rewrite history and say I wasn't successful there. Well, that's fine. People have their own opinions. I know what I done at that football club and I know where I brought them from and where I left them. Um, this time last year, they were in a 10 times better place. Um, and, you know, obviously I want them to still be successful. I have no will, will towards anybody in football. Like I always tell people, people will probably fall out of me in football, right? Because of the way I am. As a manager, I'm honest. As a player, I was honest. I tell the truth. But I can go to bed at night and say, well, at least I told you the truth. If you don't like it, I can't do anything about that. But that's the way that football is. You know, it's better being honest and, and being straight up with people. If they're not in the team, tell them why they're not in the team. Don't hide behind injury, suspensions, illness, resting. Just tell them the truth because then they can go either work on it or if that's not their game, it's not their game. They can't do anything about that. You know, I've, I've had these conversations in the last couple of weeks with players, you know. You're not in the team because I, I feel that 
uh, your lack of pace might get exposed against this team. But see, when we're playing that team there in two weeks' time, I think you'll be back in the team. For argument's sake, you know, I'm not saying that was the exact conversation. But the, that's the way I'd rather be with people. And if they don't like it, unfortunately, there's nothing I can do. But I would hope that they'll look, when they get to my stage of life, if they're becoming a manager or, or a coach or they just no interest in football, they'll go, well, fair play. At least he told us. Do you have any regrets about your time at Portland? Um, I suppose, yeah, you always have regrets, don't you? Because, you, you know, you like to win more games and, and not get the sack. But I, w I think I would have liked to have stuck to what I was doing for the first three and a half years and promoting my own players and bringing them through instead of getting blinded by outside noise of got to bring this player in or that player in or, you know, we needed more players. Because we had a good squad there. Um, and I think, you know, then, oh, you've been too loyal to them players. Well, I was loyal to them because they were playing well for me. Because we got promoted, I kept pretty much the same squad, added one or two to it and we finished ninth which was fairly successful in a 12-team league. Yeah, that's fourth and bottom. But the way that the football had changed, even in the time from leaving Warren Point to there in two years, that Premier League had gone like that because we've now a third of the leagues full-time and others that weren't full-time had been playing European football. Mm -hmm. you know, so if you look, the four full-time teams and then you've got Cliftonville and Coleraine part-time teams but continually qualifying for Europe and Glenavon and Ballymena, they were the teams that finished above us that have previously qualified for Europe so they've still got that pot of budget you know there and see money and things like that it didn't frighten me and I suppose coming out in the press I would say I'm not bothered about the league within the league there's three leagues and all that because you're still getting three points on a Saturday right but that could have been a bit of naivety me being a bit bravado you know like that because really should, could and should I have focused more to pick up points certainly last season on the teams around us but we were like we were giving them field get like we drew with them all the top teams we beat some of the top, like Lan and stuff, right? we beat them. But what the problem was, you going to absolutely knock your pan in on a Saturday against Linfield to get a draw or to get beaten in the 90th minute as we did Christian Mazinga raffled one in for 35 yards to beat two on our players out on the feet and then we had to go on Tuesday night away to Carrick. Boys couldn't give anything else. Do you know what I'm saying to you? Yeah. So did I learn from that? Yeah. But would I do anything different? Probably not because I would never knowingly go into a game sacrificing a result on a Saturday to look forward to a Tuesday because you don't know what's going to happen in between. So, caused this regrets because because we lost and I got the sack ultimately. But I got the sack. I think if they look back, I'm sure they have regrets because they didn't have a plan in place. Where I had a plan, they just give me a five-year contract. We just sold our star striker for a hundred thousand pound. It needed time, you know. We'd drawn, we we'd won in the Irish Cup. We drew with Cliftonville. Uh, Drew with Coleraine, sorry, on the Saturday. I just brought like Howard Beverland and a couple of others in there. I thought Paddy McNally was making his way back from injury. Luke Wilson, them two had both had crucial injuries. They were out for a year. You know, so mm -hmm. centre half, captain, and then I've just lost Lee Bonus. Right? And then whatever way it worked, a couple of others, Sammy McLeod had come over from England, was superb, family issues meant he had to go home. Oren Jackson came in from England, done really well for the first month, needed a hip operation. Rory Crossgrey had been flying, he'd scored four in the first five, done really well. Landed awkwardly in a cup game, should I have played him at a cup game? No. But you know, you want to win, don't you? We're playing Newington in the first or second round of the League Cup, play him. Goes up for head of lands, out. He's only coming back to play now, you know, when he's playing at Castle Wellen. So, like I've never come out and said, I'm not using these excuses. I'm just, you know, thinking, did the club think of these things? Had they, had they thought, we've invested all this time and money into this fella? And on the whim, because we got beat off Dungannon and sacked me on a Sunday. Probably not. Mm -hmm. And I know, because I know, they. I don't think then they, I think it got to a stage where I was like, look, if that's what it is, that's what it is. You know, we'll shake hands and we'll not fall out over it. But I think maybe stubbornness on my part on that Sunday, you know, I was disappointed after the result. I think I, if I went back, I'd have probably said, just forget it, let's sit, let's... 24 hours on that and that's I think that's what they wanted to do but I'd said at that stage no and, and, on, and on we went look they might think it was best for them I don't know what they're thinking I only can tell you what I'm looking at from the outside it doesn't look like um, there but Niall's going in now and hopefully he, he, he gets the results because you don't want to see him relegated either you want to see him successful but somebody has to get relegated and if you don't win enough games you get relegated and you get sacked as a manager so yeah that was it the time there but I think you know prior to that I was successful because it was, they wanted out of the championship, they'd been stuck in it. And we won the league and we got promoted and we promoted the young players, we got players international recognition. You know, sold players over to England for, for good money. Success comes in, in lots of different ways. Of course it does, yeah. So, uh, 
And now, after pour down, you end up where you're currently at today. You're at Ards as yep. first team manager. Yeah. How did that kind of? <laughs> That it happened very quick after oh, the board yeah. end, didn't it? I just remember saying that as it was so a that was the, that was the Sunday. Yeah. Um, George was obviously still, George is a player, right? So people that don't know, he, he's my son. He was playing for Port Down. They had a game on the Tuesday night, and I said to Becky, I don't really want to be sitting in the house watching Port Down on the Tuesday night now. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, that's me left. And I said, You go if you want. She said, No, I can't go to. So we actually came and we were sitting in here. We're in the North Down in Cumber, the pub. It's our local pub and restaurant. So. Anybody wants a good meal and a drink, come and see Nicky and the guys in here. But we were sitting over there, directly over there. I had the phone out and we were booking a holiday. They said, let's go and get away for a few days. But then we had to wait for the school holidays, you know, middle of February holidays for James um, to get out of school. And we settled down, we had a few drinks and a glass of wine or whatever and, and, a, and a decent meal. And went up the road and that was the Tuesday. So we would book to go. We went to Portugal. We were still waiting on... I don't really like talking about money, but I was obviously getting paid off from Port Down, so I was waiting for that check to drop or whatever way they were doing it. And there was a couple of complications or different things, one way or another. No, we were only a couple of days in, but I wanted the money in the bank before I agreed to do anything else. So, the, anyway, the next Saturday, Port Down were playing LAN, and we still wanted to watch George playing, you know. And, and myself and Dave and Dave's wife came around, and we tried to get it on the TV, but they weren't streaming it for whatever reason. We just sat there having a drink, and the news came through that I had to sack the manager. And we knew Warren Patton had been there as academy director. When I was a player at Palomino, I knew Warren. Dave works for Warren in the bakery. And uh, Dave went, flipping hell, bet your phone rings now. I said, I'm not chasing it. Well, I, hadn't, I wasn't sickened by football. You know, some people get a real bad experience and it was like, if you've been beat 20 games in a row when you get the sack, I think you'd be... But I wasn't at that stage, you know, I was still kind of fairly offbeat. And anyway, I spoke to Warren a couple of days later, went and met him. Um, the, I think they were playing Newry actually on the Friday night in the Cup. So it was kind of coming up to two weeks now from me leaving Porter down and I was doing the TV, I think Linfield was playing LAN and Dave went down to watch the New Year game and he said, look, there's some good players there, the big, big, big job on our hands if, if you take off, we take it. So next thing, we Warren Foreman, he said, can you come and meet me on Sunday? And I went and met him and we shook hands and he said, look, I've just obviously have to ratify with the rest of the board and we'll get you unveiled tomorrow. It must have been. Hi. So that was a Sunday, Sunday night, Monday. I said, well, we need to get the players and we've got a game on Tuesday. And he said, yeah, no problems at all. So we were playing lock all the way. So we took the lads, had a meet and took the lads to training on the Monday. Yeah, so it was two weeks out of work, really. Um, obviously, my money had been paid in my bank because I wanted that clear. That was why I had to wait the week because, you know, just in case any complications. Um, like kind of, I left my solicitors through the PFA in charge of all that side of it. Then And then, yeah, that was it. I went in, took the training Monday, we went to Lock Hall on the Tuesday. And I'd said to Warren on the Sunday, listen, fair enough, thank you, I'll take the job. But I'm going to be honest, I've never, I've sacrificed everything for football. Uh, my wife and my children have, and I put hold in, I'm going on Saturday to Portugal for a week and I'm not, not going. I said, I'll fly back on the Friday night or the Thursday night or whatever, I think it was the Friday night, for the game on the Saturday. But I'll, unfortunately, I'll miss balling them all the way. And he was like, no, that's fine. He said, you know, because I, like I said, look, I wasn't expecting to be back in work in three weeks from from there to now. If it just came about and I, and I took the job. So, yeah, we went, we played Lock Hall, we beat them on the Tuesday and, and then uh, we, we flew off to Portugal for a week for some winter sun. And I uh, came back and, and really got my teeth into it. You know, I was disappointed because they were kind of on a real bad run. You know, they hadn't won a home game for three and a half months or something. Um, you know, but I felt there was enough players in there to really kick start them. But... It didn't really, it didn't really get going, you know. And you could see John had obviously tried numerous things, and he was unfortunately losing his job. And he's a good guy, John, but you could see why they hadn't been winning. So it came then, and probably, and and Warren in the board and the fans probably won't appreciate hearing this, but it was probably the best thing that happened that they finished in the bottom six, because it then forced the issue of let's we've got to regroup here, regather, and reorganise this club the way it's going, and it might take. It might not be, we might not get promoted within a year, we obviously want to and, and we're still within the hunt, but it might be where, you know, 16 players left the club and we've got to redo things. Look, I, I've done it at Port Down, did it at Warren Point. You've got to rebuild and, and you've got to have a structure. There's no point just trying to go, let's sign him because he played well last week. You've got to have an idea and a structure to go forward and and you know, and, and I've spoken about it here, I like young, enthusiastic players that want to push on and kick on. So that's what we've started, you know, but. Obviously, we're not where we want to be yet. There's no problem with that. You know, I've signed a two-year contract, and 
with a bit of luck, you know, we're up and challenging this year, but I, I think I can already see the players that we've brought in, you know, have started gelling and I looked at our team Saturday and we've, I think we had eight players that I'd brought in, you know, in the starting 11 and that means it's gelling, it takes time, you know, we can't, you know, as well as I do when you're coaching, things don't just happen, you're training twice a week, we're on half a pitch at Bangor for an hour and a half, two days of the week, so these things take time, you know, one thing I would say, we've conceded too many goals so far this season, but Obviously, the plan wasn't to concede too many goals, right? So, the but is, I went back to coaching and managing when I went in at Warren Point and just, let's go and play with freedom and really go at teams and, and let's be expansive, give the fans something to enjoy, to watch. I didn't want to do what I'd just done at Warren, uh, Port Down, sorry, and at that stage. And that was one of my regrets, I suppose, that you become more pragmatic when you lose. Like, it's all right. My second game in the Premier League was, uh, the first game was Glen Avon, it was brilliant, Helter Skelter, because the way Gary plays and maybe it was like bang, 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 and they scored last kick of the, de- uh, last kick of the game, Bobby Burns scored, and we got beat 3-2, but I was really pleased because I felt we'd had a go, and, and I went, oh, we'll, go to Glen- uh, we'll go to Crusaders Tuesday and do the same, and we were four down after 20 minutes, and it soon, you know, wises you up a wee bit, you can't go and do that, you know, I've seen other managers try it, and you think, yeah, it's okay, and, and it is, and you say, no, I'm going down fighting my way of playing, but you're going to get the sack of doing that because you, you keep getting beat 4 nil every week by playing out from the back and, and sending two full-backs pushed on and all the rest of it. And you, you will, you'll get the sack. Yes, all right, it's getting the sack your way. But you're getting pumped every week and there's no... Because then what happens is the players lose belief in what you're actually asking them to do. So they stop doing that and you haven't worked on just getting eight and nine men behind the ball. And then I'd kind of gone a little bit that way at Porter Down tactic I was just over analysing everything you know I was my whole like days and nights were just spent just flat out watching our games watching the opposition's games and you don't it's too it was it was information overload for me and I wasn't I wasn't offsetting that to any of my staff or anybody else I was taking all that on myself and that wasn't making me a nice person at home so I suppose if you go back to the question you asked earlier how many regrets caused it because the way I became as a person wasn't it wasn't great. I wasn't fair on Becky and the kids. It wasn't fair on my friends and, and family away from here. So I, that is a regret, the way that I did it, because I just took everything on myself and I just like basically enclosed myself in a cocoon because I was like, I can get us out of this, no problem. But I wasn't opening up to anybody of why we could, or how we could get out of it or what the problems were. I was just taking it all on myself. And like I say, it was just taking, like I am not joking you. I was up in the morning probably five o'clock every day. I get up early anyway, right? Six o'clock, whatever, right? But in, like awful hard to get out of bed early, you know, in the middle of winter, but I was up and the chairman would be texting me at that time in the morning because he would be up early, you know, and, and the vice chairman, like, so what's up to start there? Dave's an early starter with his bakery work. So then I kind of joking by seven o'clock in the morning, I'd probably fired off a hundred and two hundred like WhatsApp messages. And like, I'd been already on the phone with Dave, you know, just we need to change the team or we need to do this or we're looking at transfers. So I'd be up then and I'd probably go to bed at 10, 11 at night. But the, all of that day would be spent on the laptop, the iPad, you know what I mean? YouTube and, um, not YouTube, sorry, Why Scout, the, which is the scouting network um, where you analyse the performances, the, the opposition corners, free kicks. And then I would just, like that was just swamping me. And then I'd drive down to Porter Down, so I'd drop James off at school, drive to Porter Down, be there for like half nine, go and sit in my office or, or sit in the lounge or whatever. and, and hook the laptop up to it and sometimes and then problems were coming to me there that I didn't like again we had like some of the lads stayed in the clubhouse right and they hadn't put the rubbish bins out right this is like the stuff right so the guy came to the club to complain that they hadn't put the wheelie bin out so then it was overflowing and it's going to obviously attract rats like I understand that is a problem right I get that so then I was like bringing that make sure you put your bins out take them to the tip right usual thing then the same guy came back to complain that they'd the bin was like, you know what I mean? So say now they, the bin fits four bin bags and they're five and the bin men won't take it, will they, if the lid don't close? So they took one bin bag out and put it in his bin and then he complained that they... And I went, so you're coming to me to tell me that they've put a rubbish bag in your rubbish bin? And he went, yeah. And the bin men took it this morning. So it was like Monday night, this was Tuesday morning. And he went, yeah, but I don't want their rubbish in my bin. So I understand that, but you complained to me two weeks ago that they hadn't put the rubbish and now they put it out, but they had one bag too many. They put it in your bin. He said, well, I took it out and threw it. And he said, and then what happened was I threw it into their garden, but it hit the fence. I hit the tree and ripped the bag. And now the stuff's everywhere. So who's going to clean that up? Said, well, not me. Like, 
<laughs> I was like going. It was just, there was just so much. Like, why am I worried about that? I'm trying to work out, are we, should we play 4-3-3 or 4-4-2 on Saturday or whatever? And I'm dealing with, like, somebody's rubbish bag over the fence. And I was like, what? So, all, like, what I'm saying is, I let everything consume me. And it just got too much when I actually, I had that much going on. I wasn't actually even focusing on what I should have been doing. You know, making the team play better. And, and when I went to Ards, I went, you know what, I'm going to separate myself from all of that. And thankfully, Warren and the board have been brilliant. I don't really have to worry about anything apart from Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday. Obviously, it's still a seven day of the week job. And I'm still, you know, I'll be out tonight and watching reserve game. I'll go to a meeting with the youth and stuff. It's not that I don't work 24-7 for them but I'm, I'm not letting it consume me in a way that if I can't deal with it you know control and controllables it was some it was one of my sayings that I said as a as a young player all the way through and I think I forgot that and I forgot what I was doing because I just got I let outside noise influence me too much thankfully and hopefully I become a better person and a better manager from knowing all of that you can only do what you can do in life you know you got it you work with the tools you got you try and improve yourself as a coach as a manager every day and learn and listen to other people um, and hopefully yeah hopefully that's what you know that that's the way that I'm going now and and I can see it and I think I'm better for the players I think I'm a better person around them I think I'm better um, I'm just I think I'm just a better person at the minute than what I was a year ago or, or just over a year ago because I'm I'm taking all of these things on board that I've learned because if you don't learn you stand still so our final question of the podcast is, what is the long-term ambitions for our football club? Well, we want to get back to the Premier League, you know, as soon as possible. Obviously, the new stadium is a big talking point. You know, we've signed the lease on the on the ground for that to be built on the Port Ferry Road there, just at the floodgates for people who know it. Um, and that's obviously a big, that's a big thing, you know, for us, for myself, for the team, but certainly for the club and the town, it'll be massive to get our football club back in in Newton Ads. Um but yeah the, the short term goals I suppose obviously is to get us back to the Premier League how quick that'll be I don't know you know ideally we, we would be up at the top now you know Lockall have had a great start Anna Warren Point ourselves Dundeller are all pushing we've had a wobble the last two weeks obviously we're at the beginning of January here chatting I'm not sure when it's going live we, we obviously have to arrest that you know the bad couple of games but People lose games of football, that's another thing I've learned. You know, you, you're know, you going to lose, you're not. Football ain't perfect, people make mistakes, ball ricochets and, and you lose a game. Um, so yeah, we want to get back to that Premier League. But it, it's about the, you know, we want to get there as soon as possible. We've got to be ready when we get back there because I know what that challenge is. And while it's a part-time league now and it is, you know, a third of it's full-time, you are full time. Once you get to that Premier League, there's no doubt in my mind you're full time. Chatting to players now, there is no days off. Everybody, I think everybody's doing three nights of the week now on the training pitch. Um, so you know that's Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. Um, they're probably having to fit a gym session on a Wednesday, but these guys are also working. You know, and, and mentally that's hard because there's a lot of Tuesday games. You know, within the, the league, some weeks you have to bring them in on a Sunday, and I really, really hate doing that because these guys, that's their only day off. You know, they're working. To get a result, you maybe need to do that, and it's not fair, you know. When you're asking boys to do it, like I say, it's part time, but it's not really because they're committing to be a full time footballer in a part time environment in part time wages. Um, so we've got to make sure that everything on the other side is ready for that. You know, training facilities and all the rest of it. We've got to go, and that'll all come in time. But we've got to get there to make see the quicker we get to the Premier League, all the rest of it will fall into place quicker you know it's it's a vicious circle isn't it so short term goal yeah get back to that Premier League and that's what I want to be as a manager the club want to be there chairman want to be there and the players want to be there as well you want to test yourself against the best don't you of course you do yeah and look it's not nice when you lose on a Saturday night but it's certainly better losing um, in the Premier League than it is losing in the Championship brilliant well that is our podcast done and we wish yourself and your club all the very best thank you and thanks very much for coming on no problem thanks for having us